Oh. Oh. Oh, let's see how. Share screen. Share entire screen. No, share this screen. And well, let's test some audio. And do it. Uh, I don't know if anybody's even on here yet, but coaches, as we get started, um, as people start filing in, um, like I said, we'll get started pr tentatively, promptly at 2 p.m. Eastern, give or take. We'll get started. Um, like I said, we're waiting on Coach Roberts and a couple others to get on. And then, like I said, we will um, get started kind of like last last month. It'll be 20 to 25 minute presentation, five minutes of QA slash prepping for the next person. Um, but yeah, until then, you get to just see a, a blank screen of me. Well, not even really of me. I'm just kind of the logo and kind of, um, I'm just going to get coach, text Coach Roberts and make sure he's good to go. So, Roberts. When you can jump on already. When you are ready, then I'm going to go ahead and just test some audio. Oh, oh. So that cheat code worked. Nope. Oh, there we go. Now I'll just leave this on the screen for right now. And then we can get started. What's going on, man? Coach, how you doing? Good. How's the family? Good. Busy morning. We did the, we went and stayed at a hotel last night because my daughter's getting her tazas out tomorrow. Ooh. So was, that was our spring break. So did like the pool hotel this morning, Easter egg hunt already. Been a busy morning. <laughs> how, how, how old is she again? Uh, the oldest is six. Okay. And then my youngest just turned three on Friday. Okay. Build that. Oh. Well, I just realized I didn't turn on. Now you'll be able to share your screen. There we go. When you're ready. But yeah. Oh, yeah. We got a couple minutes and coaches are still filing. So, yeah. Oh, God. Thank you again for helping me test yesterday, by the way. That helped. Yeah, no problem. Man. Yeah. I, that's me being paranoid. Now let's see if the audio is coming through. Well, we'll find out. Just double check. Yeah, I, that's me being paranoid. There's the echo. Yep. There it is. Echo makes echo is good sometimes. <laughs> how many? How, I, I forgot to ask you. Like, I, I know you guys will be younger this year. How many kids are you graduating? So we had a we had a unique situation where a lot of kids came out as seniors this year. Okay. That had to play since like freshman year. They just wanted to come back, back out. So we graduated like, it sounds like a lot, but I think we graduated like 16, but it wasn't really 16 seniors. You know what I mean? Like yeah. we had probably seven or eight that didn't play since freshman year. And they just came back. So, so about eight and you're so, graduating really. Okay. Yeah. Eight real ones. Now, with that being said, um, two of the kids that came out started for us, one kid like, was my three tech on the forefront from day one. Like he just he was the best kid at it, yeah. and so he he started there. He hadn't played in his freshman year and came out as a senior and started. But we, I mean, most of them contributed in some way somehow. Whether it was giving a kid a break or whatever, getting a breather for someone, put him on special teams, something like that. And and then the uh, stud running back is finally gone, right? Unfortunately, yes. Yes. <laughs> That's why okay. everybody we would play at the end of the game, they were like, Hey, thank God you're graduating. And he was like, I know him. No, we're not happy about that. <laughs> we would love to get another year out of him. But yeah, he's gone. He's going to Ashland. Him and our big offensive lineman, uh, two kids that were all Ohio for us, they're both going to Ashland, which is kind of nice. Yeah, well, I got I got lucky because that first year at um Northwestern, 
he could he I, I don't I think he had like a sprained ankle or something, which sucks for him, but like he I mean <laughs> yeah. he didn't need him, let's just be honest. But uh he didn't play that week. And then the following year, I mean that I was at Northwestern, we lo- I, fuck, I lost what seven kids in that first half, something stupid like that. Like we got like yeah, mass- it was it was a blood it was rough. I know you you were going through it a little bit there. Oh my god! Like I mean, I, it, was, it was like it was to the point where at the end of the first half, we were just trying to figure out who to put in because we had so many kids just get hurt in that first half. Wasn't your quarterback that second year at Northwestern? Wasn't he like a he didn't play it in a couple of years or something like that and came back out and yeah, so yeah, so the, the guy I, that started the year had a small fracture in his back, so I lost him week one, and then the okay. back quote unquote back up was who we started, but he hadn't played in about two years. We had a freshman that was pretty good that started this that had started this year for him that probably would have taken over midway through the season, but he broke his jaw against you guys. His uh, jaw? Yeah. So went so I think it was on one of the kickoff returns or kickoffs. He went to make a tackle on one of your kids, and it just hit it perfectly where your kid's knee just hit, hit him. him right under his <laughs> um helmet, right on, at the bottom of the chin. And it broke yeah. his jaw. Uh, he's he missed the rest Jesus. of the year. Like he, um, so yeah. So yeah. I mean, we had a I, God. I couldn't. I mean, we literally lost. I think seven kids that week. We played you. Um, I remember you saying something about that when that game was over. You made a comment about like losing a bunch of kids. <clears throat> I was that was my first year ever as a DC. So I was just like, when the game was over, I was like, all right, how did we do? Like I don't even know. Like yeah, we won the game, but like how did we do? I don't know. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, I mean, it is what it is. Like when you get injuries like that, like it just it it happens, and um, yeah, those freak things will happen. It's... I mean, it is what it is. You just gotta. I mean, you live and you learn. I mean, obviously, I did. I mean, I had a pretty good year this year. So yeah, yeah, for sure you did. I mean, I, I yeah, the I, injury I, bug will get some people. Yeah, but that's I, what our running back. I mean, he got hurt against Urbana. <laughs> week whatever that would have been week six and so he didn't play the whole second half and we thought it was going to be out and so his doc the doctor cleared him he played against week in week seven against london week eight against bell fountain and he was struggling through those and uh yeah he ended up he got shut down like weeks nine ten and then and eleven that I really the, the Bishop Reedy game our, our week eleven first round of the playoffs. If we have him, I think we win that game. Oh yeah, I but mean, it is what it is. Stuff happens, sucks, but oh, hundred percent does. But it, I mean, he knows what I do. You just you you adapt and kind of go there, and I don't you, know. think you just got that's when coaching starts, really. Yeah. Is did you do good enough to get your backups ready? I mean, that's yeah. That's, we we all look great when we have dudes. <laughs> like I mean, yeah. I mean, that solves the problem. Well, I remember my first year at Olin Change of Liberty that Brendan White, his senior year, we didn't really have a quarterback that year, and I had just gotten there, so I didn't really know what was going on with personnel wise. But he was a dude, and so he started a quarterback for us. And there was times where, like, as the O line coach. Steve Hale would be like, hey, we're running this play. I'm like, we want to block it this way. He's like, sure, it doesn't matter. We got Brendan White. <laughs> and Brendan White won, like, our first game of the season that year was in Pittsburgh against – uh it's going to kill me who that was that we played. But it was out in Pittsburgh. And we got to the end of the game, and we were on, like, the goal line. And he was like, I don't care. Just Brendan White, keep the ball. That was the name of the player that we scored on to – uh to tie it up or no, we were down by one. And then he was like, we're going for two. Like we're going home with the loss or a win, but it's a three hour bus ride home. We're going home. We're not going to overtime, but it was Brandon White. Go be a dude. That was basically the name of the play to, to win the game for us. Yeah. Helps me have dudes for All sure. Right. Let me tweet this out and then you can go share your screen coach. You have about yeah. two minutes and then, um, I'm going to – just thinking off the top of my head who else I need to – ooh, I know who I could tag. 
Um, who am I? God dang it. I'm missing somebody. Um, I, I mean, I, uh, as much as I've, some of these new algorithm things on Twitter <laughs> make it a lot more difficult to tag people. <laughs> yeah. The Twitter has been a little funky lately the way things pop up and, Well, that's tweeted out. I mean, we just started really putting because uh, I run all like, the social media stuff for our team, and we just started doing some Instagram stuff because that seems to be where the kids are starting to really focus on now is Instagram. Yeah, well, so we just made an Instagram account, trying to push that. Well, that's 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 the thing I've noticed is as much as high school and college coaches are still on Twitter, and some and some kids are. They've shifted to – kids have shifted to Instagram. Yeah, Instagram and, and Snapchat. Like, those yeah. two things are what kids use now. Yeah, but I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm wary of having a, just a Snapchat and having – like, just – yeah. <laughs> Woo. It's, it's a different beast trying to mess with social media. Yeah. Well, all right. Um, like I said, coaches are still filing in. I'm going to do my little intro. Then you get started, coach. Um, and then I'm going to disappear from this room for a second just to go downstairs and make sure the sound's working from a separate room. Um, coaches, we're going to get started. Um, I know coaches are still filing in. I just tweeted out. I'm going to keep sending out um, links to various places, um, but we are going to get started. Uh, Coach, Ro Coach Chris Roberts is the defensive coordinator at Jonathan Alder High School here in Ohio. Um, he's become a good friend of mine over the past years. We text and uh, talk all – Fairly frequently. Um, coaches will talk middle of the field coverage and cover three variations um, that they do at JA. Um, coach, you got about 20, 25 minutes, and then we'll save about five for QA. So the floor is yours, my friend. Awesome. Thank you very much. Appreciate you. Appreciate everybody uh, either watching it live or kind of checking in later. Um, honored to be here, kind of just talking ball with guys. So, like I've said, uh, Chris Roberts from Jonathan Alder, defense coordinator there. Um, kind of Topic that I'm kind of talking about this cover three and the variations we use off of it. Uh, I'm a big believer in cover three, uh, especially at the high school level. Um, so just keeping the middle of the field closed right away. Um, if here's my background that nobody cares to see, but every coach puts up there. So there it is. But moving on. So kind of get into cover three and why we like to be a one high defense. So for us, we really believe that it, it helps us with the run game more than the pass. Um, we see a little bit more run in our conference. So it allows us to get eight guys into the box a little easier. Um, and it pre-snap takes away that the easiest deep ball, which is that post play. Um, most offensive coordinators, they see that single high safety sitting over top. They just don't call a post because uh, it should be taken away. So right away, we kind of have the mentality of by being one high and cover three, we know that the middle of the field's kind of taken away and they're not going to call it. So now we know we can really have an emphasis on getting to the sides and, and hash the sideline uh, is where most of the stuff is going to happen, uh, ideally, right on paper. Um, the other part of that is because we're taking away the middle of the field, uh, we're inviting the high school quarterback to make that difficult throw to the sideline. It's a little bit more difficult. The ball's in the air a lot longer. So we're kind of inviting it, we're just kind of baiting them in for it. Go ahead, throw it to the field if, you know, Maybe the boundary doesn't matter. We want you to throw the ball to the side. Um, we expect it to go there. And if it's going to the side, it's in the air a little bit longer. So everybody has a chance to react on that ball. Um, and that's really helped us quite a bit. Uh, just last year, our league um, that we're in, it's a little more run heavy of a league, but the league average was uh, eight interceptions. Um, we had 19 interceptions this year. And it's really just the way that we play it. Uh, I didn't come up with this like with most of football. Uh, you take stuff from other people, and uh, a lot of what we do defensively, I got uh, from a really good coach, uh, 
that was the defense coordinator when I was an O-line coach at Old Angel Liberty High School here in Central Ohio. And uh, he took that with him and, and I got a couple other buddies that now use this kind of a system. Uh, and, and it does really good stuff for us. And the kids seem to like it. Uh, as we get into it, like we call it cover three. Some people might look at it. It's kind of almost like a variation of Tampa two as well because of the way we play it, which we'll get into uh, here. So how we kind of have our base rules. So kind of building everything off a of two by two. So our base rules, um, we can keep six guys in the box, whether we're a four, two, cause that's what we've been the last, most of the time, uh, last two years, um, whether we're a four, two, four, four, however you want to call it, just keep those strong safety hybrid types happy. Sometimes you call them a DB. Sometimes you'll call them a linebacker, but it's that four, two box. Um, we're kind of pushing to go more of a three, three, kind of a bastardized three, three look, um, more of a tight front, but Either way, it doesn't change really our coverages because it's only a six-man box. The other guys on the edge out there, um, can those other five dudes can do the same thing no matter what we're doing up front. So it kind of keeps it simple for them. And it's a little bit different, uh, especially when we get to our corner play. Uh, starting with the inside out, though, our what we call dogs and bandits. That's our outside linebacker types. We have them playing four by two inside, so I call, we call it negative two. So they're playing four by negative two off of number two. And they're going to get their run read first because, like I told you guys, we, we, we're in a run-heavy league. But they're going to be a run read first. They're going to read that in man on line of scrimmage to a near back and see what's going on there. We want them to be very aggressive in the run game. Uh, our defense, our kind of defensive motto is default aggressive. Uh, big Jock Olympic fan. And uh, default aggressive, like if we know what we're supposed to be doing, we know our keys, we know our reads, then we can play a lot faster and a lot more of an aggressive mind frame and it should just naturally happen because we know what we're doing. So those guys kind of get that read. And if they are in the pass, you know, they get a pass read, whatever, high hat from that enemy in line of scrimmage. Now their goal is to collision number two and route to getting underneath the number one. We don't use the word flats um, because what we have found is that when we say flats to a kid, now that kid starts to sit at like five yards when you get like a deep out or a comeback or something like that. Well, he's not doing anything to defend that when he's at five yards. And to him, that's what he thinks flats is. For whatever reason, that seems to be like a common theme in high school athletes' head that flats is at five for whatever reason. So we tell them, you're going to collision number two. Obviously, people think that when you're running cover three, that four verts is going to hurt you. Um, I would say, yeah, it, it probably would. Uh, I feel like we have our rules kind of help us with that spacing. Like, you can't get that seam shot necessarily um, to the number two if we collision that. And that also play into what our corners and how they play things as well in a second. But so, like I said, they collision number two, and they're getting underneath of number one. We kind of cap them off at about 10 yards. Obviously, game plan might dictate maybe we'll cap them off at 12. They don't sink any deeper than that. But that's helped us quite a bit uh, just by telling those two guys, get underneath the number one, not flats. The number one might change. If it's four verts, yeah, it's truly number one. If it's a flood concept, for example, well, number one might be the guy running that intermediate out route because he's becoming number one, he's the closest guy to the sideline. So just kind of we rep that a little bit, and the kids understand that um, number one can change based on how those routes develop. So we'll do that to both sides. Um, we really don't we, – we try and keep a strong side and a back side. Our dog is usually our strong side guy, or we call the B the bandit. He's our back side guy. Um, sometimes we'll go field and boundary just based on athletic ability or whatever. So that's our, those two guys. Now our corners, and this is where it gets a little, uh, we, we feel like it's a little bit different. Our corners are playing a uh, seven by one, negative one. So they're seven yards deep, one yard inside. And uh, this is where we get really aggressive with our corners. Even though they're really cover three, their read, their first read is the quarterback. Um, their eyes are on the queue. And I'll show you guys a couple of clips of this uh, near the end of this presentation. But they're reading uh, the quarterback then number two, then number one. Um, we want to be aggressive in, in all the things that we do on defense. And so this has allowed us to be aggressive on those short routes. Uh, sometimes you see a guy playing cover three and you just throw hitches down the field. 
and you're giving up the hitch. Got it. Well, we don't allow that to happen. Or the slant, whatever the quick concept is. We try not to let that happen. And so our corners know, like, you're kind of playing some short routes. If you get the read to, if not, you can get back. So the way we teach that, our corners are looking at the quarterback, and if he drops, I drop. So as I look at the quarterback, he catches that, that if he's in shotgun, under center, it doesn't matter. If he's dropping, now I know I can drop. Um, or if it's a mesh point, if he's kind of play actioning it, we treat that as a drop as well. So we, then we'll get depth. If he catches the ball and he tries to take that hand off the balls because it's a quick throw, especially from shotgun, he gets that, the ball, boom, and he opens up and takes the hand off. He's trying to throw something. That means he throws something quick. It's a slant, a hitch, a bubble, whatever it is. If I see quarterback take his hand off of the ball, I am downhill hill looking for what's that route. And we rep that a lot so that we kind of they get comfortable with it. <laughs> but uh, a military guy, I, I like to use the concept of pull pin on the grenade. If that quarterback takes his hand off the ball, it's like he's pulling the pin on a grenade. He's got to throw it. It's going somewhere. Um, if you pull the pin on a grenade and you don't let go of it, that's going to be a bad day for you. Same concept for a quarterback. Most high school quarterbacks, they pump fake with both hands on, they turn the shoulders. So hand off, we're downhill looking for it. If you get a drop from the quarterback, then our eyes go to number two. Number two, and then we go into the basic kind of cover three reads where we're reading two to one. If two goes vertical, I'm apexing those two. And this is where it kind of turns into that Tampa two look because uh, the way we play in our free safety. But we're inviting that sideline throw. Our corner uh, is going to apex one and two during his drop and then try and split those two and, and get depth. Our free safety, uh, we put his toes at 10, and he's reading the quarterback, and he's trying to apex both number twos. But we tell him he's toes at 10, and we say slow to go. We want him to be an extra guy in the box if it is run. He can he has the ability to get downhill and get in there. But he's slow to get depth, and he can afford to be slow because those corners who are apexing those number twos, as they're doing that, they're almost in like a what would end up being like a cover two look because of their alignment. So it allows him to be kind of slow to go and get back. And he can also now be aggressive in the run game. With our inside backers, if, we, if we're in this stack look, then now we can play games with those three, our Mike, our Sam, and our Will. Um, they will have a hook curl or a pressure. So they kind of know that typically if I'm going to send the mic, for example, our Sam and Will, there are hook curl guys. They're looking for a crossing route on their side that they can jam. But if I send either the Sam or the Will, our mic just automatically knows we build it in. Hey, if I'm sending to Sam, I have to replace him in that coverage. So I get pass read. I know the Sam's gone. I'm going to have to drop a little bit wider because I'm replacing the Sam backer. Same thing for the other side, the Will. Um, we can do some five-man pressures where whoever that – backer is that's left over now he knows i'm just i got that whole middle i'm not really dropping to a, a hook curl area i kind of have the middle by myself because both of the backers are gone so that's kind of our base way of aligning to a two by two look just kind of diagramming it here a little bit um those red triangles around those linebackers uh, those are the guys that we can play games with so now we can send different guys from wherever um but they just kind of know how to fix themselves because they know that we typically, if we're sending you know, four-man pressure, they got to have the two hook curl areas. And like I said, our dog and bandit, they're getting their kind of hop step in their read. Once they get past, they're going to collision number two in route to number one. I said one of the rules that we uh, didn't emphasize my first year doing this, we would tell them we were big on collision. We would yell, like, collision. I'm yelling it all summer. I, I yell collision all the time. And then our kids would give that collision, but they wouldn't get underneath the number one. And so we have to really, like the second year of really doing this, had to emphasize that collision happens in route to getting underneath the number one. If he's not there, if he's running a shallow route or a quick out or something, you might not ever get collision on number two, and that's okay. His route didn't allow it, you to. But if he, as you're taking your read steps, and you go to get underneath the number one, as number two is running a vertical, that's where that collision needs to happen. Um like I said, we didn't, we didn't coach it the right way my first year doing it. And we had kids kind of going way too far uh, into the route and not really getting underneath the number one. So we did have to work that a little bit. But once we got it down, 
it worked pretty well for us. Um, another couple things that we can do with this is instead of collisioning the dog and bandit, if we are outside backers, if we have a team that is just throwing a lot of really quick hitches, we just can't get there for whatever reason, uh, quick outs, things like that. And, and that flat area becomes a problem for us. Um, we have a call where we can actually send them straight there, no collision. So if we kind of expect it, it's a passing down tendencies kind of tell us, Hey, they're going to try and attack the, the, the quick routes on the edge. Then we might call uh, like a fly coverage where instead of collisioning, you're going to turn and run to get underneath the number one on the snap. We don't even care about the run game at that point. Tendency tells us to throw in it. And that's actually helped us quite a bit too. We've got a nice amount of interceptions off of that because they're out there a lot faster than expected because it's a little bit different. Uh, it's the only change on that coverage. It's the only, those are the only two guys that change. Nobody else does. And it's just a way of kind of mixing in how to handle those flats areas for us. Again, just diagramming it up. There's no collision or anything here. You can see the dog banner just, they're flying out to it right now to get underneath the number one. And then for our trips, check on this. A couple of different ways we can do this. So um, when we get a trips look, so the, we don't really change anything because we feel like our rules have a, already kind of put everything in place for us. So on the trip side, we're still going to play seven by negative one um, on number one with our corner. Our dog or outside backer on that side is still going to play four by negative two. Um, he on number two, he can still do that. We might be able to like, bump our our Sam out or whoever's on that field side. Uh, we can bump him a little bit, depending on what we decide to do with the backside outside backer, um, what we call the bandit. We can play some games with him. Sometimes we can have him bump the box and kind of give a three four look in the box now. Um, we'll also be able to drop him into a too high look, but we can play games there if we need to. He doesn't have a number two to worry about anymore, so he's a little more free to take care of stuff. Uh, when we get that, we also now have to tell our Will, and he knows when there's a trips look, he's the one that's going to be looking for that crosser. He's our robber, as we call it, um, looking for that number three. Uh, a lot of teams you're going to run. I know I came up in an air raid system. So you run your four verts concept out of this. He's trying to do the under Sam over Mike. Well, our Will's looking for that because he is a little bit closer to that trips now if we get bumped over. Um, the big thing with this is our backside corner, so our boundary corner typically. His rules don't change. He just now knows that he's going to end up manned up on number one because of the way his rules work. He's still going to read the quarterback. He's still going to look for that, and if the quarterback drops, he's going to say, okay, I'm going Q2-1. Quarterback drops. I need to drop and read number two. If there is no number two, but we don't treat the running back as number two. Some people will do that. We're talking detached out of the box receivers. There is no number two. Now I'm just locked on to number one. And that's rules are already built in that way for him. So he gets Q drop. There is no number two. Boom. I may end up on number one, even though it's still just our cover three concept because there's nobody else to worry about. So the rules are already built in for that to happen backside. Like I said, we can play games with it a little bit because of that. Uh, uh, only have one receiver or outside back on that side. We can do things where we can bracket number one if he's, if he's one of their dudes. Um, like I said, we can bump the box here. All kinds of different things we can do. Because he's most likely going to get locked up, that allows us to take our free safety and cheat him to the trip side. And now he can worry about apexing number two and number three on the trip side. Again, worried about four verts. So if we get that four verts concept, even though our will is going to rob it from underneath, our free safety should be able to get in between those two and play play both of them uh, from his position. He can bump over in game plan. We try to tell him uh, ghost tight end. So if there's no tight end, he just just outside the, the tackle there um, to the trip side. But nothing has to change in that. Everybody gets kind of just follow their rules. So we don't have to have a crazy – you know, trips check, we get a team that likes to play tempo or whatever. We don't need to do a lot of communication. It's all, all kind of built in already. Because of that, though, um, our Sam, we don't feel like we can play games with him. Uh, we're not a fan of sending the Sam if there's a trips look because that's a lot of space for the linebackers to have to cover after they worry about run as well. So we don't play games with him, but now we can play games with, like I said, like that backside backer we call our bandit. Um, he can play his regular cover three rules 
and get to underneath the number one. We can send him and just leave number one locked on by the corner. A couple of different games we can play with him there. And this is the same thing. It's trips, but here's where we just call give it a too high look. And we'll do some too high stuff uh, just to kind of mix things up. So this is one of the times we like to do that. We'll go a uh, too high call, and he's still going to come downhill and take care of getting underneath the number one um, if it's just our base cover three call. But now it's a too high look. So, you know, as an offense coordinator, I'm getting a different read from the defense. Uh, is it the same? Is it not? Uh, what coverage are you in? Just trying to hide it a little bit, a little bit with that too high kind of look. But like I said, we can play all kinds of games there if we want to. The rules didn't change. Most people don't even like the guys that were on our trip side, our field corner, our outside backer on that side, our Sam, our free, doesn't affect anything that they're doing if we put him in a too high look. He can maybe bump that free over a little bit just because he's back there, depending on what he's doing. Um, sometimes we'll have him play some deeper coverage there to help us if that's a good dude. Uh, we've played some teams that have just a stud receiver or a quarterback that we know can can make that throw. He maybe will go deep in, in, in a too high look to help with that. Um, we have a kid uh, in our conference who is going to be a senior, and he's uh, really good, committed to Ohio State, and like number six in the nation. He can throw the ball and put the ball wherever he wants. We maybe will drop that guy to help take away some of that area for that reason. But typically, most high school quarterbacks, they, they, they can't make that throw. Because when we're going too high, we don't have as many guys to play with, we feel like. So if he is deep, we're, like, we're not going to blitz him or anything like that from that depth. So we only have two guys to play with. But this is kind of what it looked like. Um, that backside, outside backer is now depth, has coming from depth. But he's downhill, kind of getting underneath of number one in our base call. And we can – come up with other calls where they maybe they'll switch roles and the corner will play underneath and that guy will play over top of number one if he's a dude and we want to bracket it that way just to give it a different look. But at base level, everything stays the same there. And then this was our kind of our cloud coverage. So we can go to that too high look. We've given them that once already. So now uh, we can play some cloud three to this where we're going to have our corner go ahead and sit and if we feel like our boundary corner uh, it can lock up number one and, and do the job and not need any help, then we'll go into some cloud coverage. So our corner knows what we call cloud coverage. He's going to be sitting there. Our free is now going to rotate over. And now that backside, outside backer, hybrid type is going to be our deep middle guy. Um, because of that, our dog also knows he doesn't have to get underneath the number one anymore in this coverage. He knows he's got help by that corner. Um, now we can start playing games with him or really the Sam because we've got a couple more guys in that underneath area to the field. Kind of what that would diagram like here. So, again, we can play games with our field outside backer, which we call dog. We can send him. We can send the Sam. Our Mike is getting the mix there a little bit. But all we're doing is sit in that corner, and he'll look and pre-snap it'll look the same as a regular two high look. And it's all still just cover three. Coach, you got five so, minutes. Thank you. So it's still just cover three. Um, it's three deep. We're giving up. And we know in our cloud coverage, we're giving up that uh, single receiver side. And if they run a wheel, uh, if they like to run wheels by the running back, that's what the first concern is. What if they run a wheel by the running back? Well, if they like to do that or they have a receiving running back, we might not run that cloud, obviously, as a game play kind of thing. Um, but we're going to take away what they want to do. And that's – one thing I learned when I became a D coordinator, take away what they want to do and make them get deeper in their playbook. If they don't, if they do it once in a while, uh, I'm, I'm willing to roll the dice. I'm an aggressive kind of guy like that. I'll roll the dice a little bit if that's what I feel tendency calls for. <laughs> All right, so a couple of clips of, of what this looks like. So in this clip, um, we're going to see our corner here to the uh, bottom of the screen in the boundary. Um He's reading the quarterback's eyes, and we're going to get a really good jump on the ball because of it, and which is going to cause him to be able to get uh, a good pick six here. So I'm going to play in slow mo because I know sometimes the video feed comes through kind of funky. He sees that quarterback drop right there. His eyes are on the quarterback. He sees that. Boom, hands off of the ball. Our corner is already breaking downhill. Where is it going? <clears throat> he starts downhill. He sees that it's kind of going to be a speed out of some sort. So he's able to adjust and get that ball 
for a pick six. This is all because he's reading the quarterback. We feel like that gives him that extra step to get to that and make a play. And we're not looking for pick sixes. We're looking to get down there and stop that play from getting anything. The pick six is just extra in our mind. We're thinking, okay, he can take care of that quote unquote flats area by doing it, but a little extra for us with the pick six there. <laughs> Here, uh, this is a team that we knew they were they were throwing the ball a little bit more out of this two by two formation, especially when they were pistol. It was kind of a we felt was a little bit of a tell that it was gonna be a pass play. So our safety in the middle of the field, instead of slow to go, we let him get a little depth on these situations. He was a senior who could really see things really well anyways you see really bad job with our collision here by this strong side uh backer he's supposed to be collision and getting underneath the number one i don't know what he's doing there he's spinning like a top but they did try to run the post by uh this number one receiver to the bottom of the screen and we have a really a corner who had to play football for a couple of years who should have been over top of this a little bit better. Luckily, our free safety, though, Apex and the twos sees that. He's able to make a play on it, get a good interception for us, taking away that post. We don't think you can run a post against cover three. Like We feel like we're confident that our guys will make a play there. So it just leads to a good interception for us right there. Um is another example, fast forward to where it happens, of our free safety still being able to look in the box, and, but then get depth. We have good corner coverage, so we got a corner over top of this post. Our free safety underneath of it, bracketing him, <coughs> leads to an interception for us. We're just putting our guys in good positions to make this stuff happen. And then uh, another clip here, this is we're going to see our linebacker um, able to get a good read as he's trying to looks for the crosser that's not there. He opens up and he's uh, he's underneath of that post and able to make something happen for us. Of course, they, they have to throw this ball underneath because of where our corner is playing this guy. It's just a good spot by our inside backer there, making something happen. Last clip here. Uh, this is the team that likes to spread the field a little bit. And uh, we were able to spread our inside backer with it. And you'll see he's able to get here and, a lot of people try to attack this area, the hook current area that number three can get to. We feel like our guys can still get out there and make a play. And that's what happens here. He's able to get out there, just touch the ball. And that's all we need. Our turnover circuit kicks in. We get an interception. This was, I think, the second offensive play of the game for them. We we're able to get an interception early on. We just feel like by playing the cover three look, it gives our guys the ability to play. Uh, to the edge and, and be just more athletic than the other team. So that's how we run our middle of the field coverage stuff. Um, here's my contact info. You can send me an email, hit me up on Twitter or X or whatever it's called. I'm always down to talk ball. Um, so yeah, if there's any questions, we can go into that. Um, currently no, but like I'll give I got a couple seconds. I think we've had close to like, like 75 coaches on so far on and off. Um, but coaches, his stuff's on the screen. Do not hesitate to reach out. Um, like I said, I'll, I'll again, kind of like our last clinic, we will leave this up and then we'll cut it up. So each and then, but do not hesitate to ask any of our coaches, uh, reach out to them. Um, I mean, coaches pretty easy to get hold of unless he's with his kids, then it's it's a whole different game. But as as most parents, um, but yeah, now coach, I think. I think you did a great job. Like I said, I, I do like I did like the um uh you, you kind of okay, you can't stop the hitch. We're just gonna go and push them out and and get there. That's a nice little variation that um thankfully you didn't run against. I've had me. some guys I've had some guys I tell him like uh, a good buddy of mine's the head coach at uh Columbus City School, uh Ryan Sayers, the head coach at Northland, and we'll talk about this stuff. And he's like, So you're just letting your guy come down the hill? I'm like, Yeah, he's like, that's ballsy. I, sometimes you got to be ballsy, I feel like, and that's what we do. So, and and it works for us. Like I said, we haven't been beat on a double move yet. That's a, the first concern. Well, what about that hitch and go? It's high school football. If we get a hitch and go, I tell my guy, just tackle the receiver. If we get a 15 yard penalty, I'll take it. <laughs> he knows what I do, though. It's all, it's all relative to what your league is, too. Like, yeah. I mean, as you mentioned, I've coached in your league. Like, it's a very run, like I don't I don't care what formation they're in. It's a league that wants to run the football. 
That 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 is like there's very few teams in that league in any given year that are going to throw for an obscene amount of yards. Like it's just right. And most of the quarterbacks in your league are also runners. Like, um, so yeah. Yeah, it's, we just we don't feel like there's not a lot of high school quarterbacks that are going to be able to throw the ball all the way out to the sideline. There's just not a lot of those out there. Um, we can adjust if there is, but majority of the time there's not. And so okay. we'll take care of the run with eight and leave three guys over top of it. If and that we feel like cover three does that for us, it's kind of built in to to take care of the run game for us. Well, uh, Coach, you can go ahead and share your screen. Like I said, coaches, do not hesitate to reach out to Coach. Um, at this point, I'll kind of let the transition kind of go. Uh, Coach uh, Tatum, I know, I believe you're on. I'll hit the ask the unmute button, see if that works. Um, and I know – oh, there we go. Coach, there she go. Yep. how you doing, Coach? I'm good, man. How are you doing, Coach? Doing good. It's been it's been a lot of tag for us to get on each other and talk to each other, but like it's it's finally there, so that's good. So. I know, man. I, I, and I apologize for that. I just moved into a new house today, um, so I'm kind of in a new venue for me. So it's kind of crazy. You know, spring break's coming up, so we can slow down a little bit. Yeah. So, uh, so Coach, while I do my little spiel, um, you can go ahead and share your screen, um, right. and then by the time I think I'm done with my spiel, um, we'll be back on track on time because we're slightly ahead of schedule coach got done and i got like less than a minute to do my spiel um so uh and yep okay perfect um so coaches um how do i want it that i mean so far so well um i think we've had close to somewhere between 75 and 100 coaches jump on and off um with our nice little youtube analytics and what all that lovely jazz um Coach Ian Tatum is our next speaker. He's the offensive coordinator at Walkertown High School in North Carolina. Uh, Coach also has his own YouTube channel, um, is very active on Twitter, um, does, has done a lot over the past, I think, probably since really this offseason, but really last year too, to help kind of kind of like me spread some lot of free content, help coaches learn. Um, so after Coach is done today and after we're done today, if you want to go check out any of his stuff, um, don't, don't hesitate to do so. Uh, but coach is going to talk counter uh, counter variations and drills, and um, I think I, I think as far as I can tell, everything's working fine. So, coach, the the floor is yours. Awesome. Well, I just want to say thank you to Coach Banshee for doing this. Um, if you've been following me for any length like, of time, you know that I do clinics like this as well, and I know it's not easy to put together, and it can be a hassle. So, appreciate him for doing that. Um, and if all of you guys hanging out learn a little ball on a Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon. It's great. Guys. So uh, I'm Ian Tatum, uh, offense coordinator at Walker High School here in North Carolina. Uh, I'm going to talk about counter and everything I'm going to go through and talk about is nothing new. I'm not doing anything groundbreaking and stuff that I've talked about a lot. I just, I really love counter uh, and I love the variations off of it. So what we're going to talk about today is just GT. We're talking about QGT with a bash, toss, read, and GH. And I'm going to kind of fly through, and I've got 25 minutes to kind of talk about this stuff, but uh, i got some some diagrams, <clears throat> excuse me, and I have film that I want to get to. Uh, I, I was trying this past week, I was sick on Tuesday, and I couldn't get my film for my drills, guys. So I'm going to talk about some drills to do, but I don't have my film for the drills, uh, and a couple of my guys were pretty shy with running the drills this week anyway. But um, that's my contact, and I'll kind of come back to that in a minute. Um, and we will get it started. Let's see if I can move that. All right. So we're just going to hop in some diagrams first. Um, and I'm not going to insult anybody's intelligence. Uh, I, I'm going to say we most of us know what GT counter is, but I am going to talk about some rules and some things that we uh, teach in our install because we've been doing, getting ready to go into the spring. Uh, so GT counter is a gap scheme run. Uh, this is probably this is our second run that we install in our in our scheme uh, it's very big for us uh, number one will be counter i mean i'm gonna be power uh, we do different variations of power as well but um what we'll do is uh we simple gap down backer rules so i love coaching podcast gap down backer um uh, when uh, a buddy and i started our own podcast we we're like man we need a name for podcast and i was like well banter has got the best name there is so shout out to coach but got down backer um, we're, we're, we're head up to backside on the front side 
Do you have anybody in your head up on your backside gap? You block them. If not, you're looking for a double team opportunity to the front side and you're working to a backside linebacker. So case in point, uh, this right tackle, does he have anybody head up backside? He does. He has his nose right here. Um, and I'm not, I'm not worried about letters just like that in this diagram, but this this it should be a three technique right here. Somebody's backside gap, yep. Right guard, head up the backside. If he was more than a three technique, he would not have somebody head up the backside, but we tell him, look, two is better than one. Look for a double team opportunity with your play side buddy. So they would double this three technique to the backside linebacker. Uh, and we have gotten away from shoulder to shoulder double teams, especially on gap. Uh, we're, we're moving to Gallup this year, uh, kind of just being like I can do what I want, kind of. Uh, so I'm going. I'm talking to a lot of my buddies, and we're going to be going to Gallup. So this outside player on the double team is coming down to Gallup and knock this three technique into the A gap. Okay, the guard's going to seal it into the A, and then the tackle once he gallops. And we'll talk about this in drills. Once he gallops and gets his hips set on that 45 degree angle. He's now working for the backside linebacker. Um, the center in this diagram, he's going to block back. Uh, we do have a call that we'll make. We'll make a cage call, which essentially tells uh, the center and the guard on the backside they can switch responsibilities. So let's say – let me go and edit this right here. So let's say that we had um, a backside three, the play side A, right? Uh, uh, so we would – Switch responsibilities for the guard and the center. We could have the center make cage cage. He would trap and the guard would stay backside. Um, and or we could go, we could go ahead and block back all the way back to the backside three. However you want to do it. If you have a guy that can block a backside three, man, and do it. If not, pull the center. I mean, let them kids get out and get some love. Um, but just based off of this, um, we are going to block back. And then the backside guard, unless he gets a cage call on all our gap schemes, will pull. Just needs to know if it's gal, uh, counter or power. Counter, he's going to trap pull, which is a, which is a, a pull for a first level defender, three technique, two uh, whatever it is, four or five whatever it is outside, first level defender, um, or it could be an overhang against like an odd front. Backside tackle on counter, he's going to pull, he's going to skip pull. Uh, I tell them skip pull is for a second level defender uh, to keep your shoulder square, get around the double team tight, and work vertical for a uh, first wrong color jersey. I don't tell them it's the wheel. I don't tell them it's number four. I tell them first wrong color jersey because they might do some funky stuff over here in this hole, and I don't need him thinking that much. You get around a double team, they call it scraping paint off the tackle's butt. I see the first wrong color jersey, and I am blowing him up. Um, some guys are saying, hey, I teach him trying to fit inside, trying to fit outside. I don't do that. I tell them to go straight down the middle of the defender uh, the best they can, reason being, so when this running back slides to the quarterback and gets downhill into the tackle's pocket, he can get right behind my tackle and he has a two-way go. If I pick a side of the tackle, now the, the running back has to pick a side. I would rather the running back be an athlete and make us right. So we're just running straight through that linebacker and he makes us right and he makes a cut. Uh, instead of things being pre-planned. Because when you pre, in my opinion, when you pre-plan things, that's what they stick with. That's the only thing they have in their minds. When that plan doesn't work, then things go wrong. So give them multiplicity. Uh, and this this Y, H-back, it could be whatever it is. Um, he has the backside uh, C-gap. Um, just keeping this five technique out um, and, and just kicking him out of that classic J-block, like on power, right? So we do, we do a lot of same side runs when it comes to GT. Uh, so that's why he's on the right. He'll slide and he'll get back out into the tackle. Um Next variation, uh, we're going to talk about Q counter. Uh, I really love running Q counter. Uh, and I'm a big tight ends H-back guy because I'm an offensive line coach. So, of course, I want more guys that can block. So, um, we got a, a tight end on the line, and it's just a 4-3 box. Um, what we would do is we make a heavy call. That's why it says heavy right here. We make a heavy call, which tells this tight end to go to number two in the box. Okay, because we'll start our count one, two, three. Well, there's three in here, so we'll go. He goes to two, double team goes to three, and the pull goes to, to, to number one. So the tight end goes straight to the, straight to the mic. The double team works to the backside to number two. Block back. There's a lot of, di there's a lot of, a lot of lines in there right now, guys. I'm sorry, but 
trap, skip pull, and now the running back is going to mesh. It's going to like a token fake mesh with the run with the quarterback, kind of get to the quarterback and then go block the, the C gap. Um, if he's really tight, like this, uh, this end right here is squeezing the pool. That's where we're going to bring in some of our other variations here in a minute. But this is what we like right here, running quarterback counter. Um, quarterback is going to ride with the fake, and then he's getting back play side. Um, and he's going to be selling like he's going outside, and he's going to stick his foot and get north. Okay, So that's basic quarterback counter, and this is nothing new. And people might be like, hey, you know, this is nothing new, Coach. But yeah, you're, you're 100% right. But when you're running in these different variations, trust me, it, it, it's really, really good. So, again, like we talked about with uh, that end, it squeezes the pull. Okay, if this end squeezes the pull, well, then, all right, the next variation, we're going to run bash. And if you follow me, you know much about me. You know, bash is one of my favorite plays in football. So, essentially running GT to the left. Okay, got it done back here. Boom, double team to the backside. Okay, we have a backside of three, so we could make a cage call on the center traps and the guard stays. The tackle still wraps, um, but we just block him back to three. Okay, trap, wrap. Now the running back is going to flip. He's going opposite. He is running, we tell this guy right here, he is running a 40-yard dash to the hash. Okay, and I'll go ahead and draw this up. So he's running a 40-yard dash. He's going to get to the quarterback. He's running full speed. Quarterback's going to shuffle, shuffle with the, with the running back. He's either going to give it or he's going to pull it, right? We know how to read things, right? He stays out, we pull it, he stays in, we give it. So he's 45, 40 yard dash to the hash. Once he gets to the hash, then he's going, then he's going numbers, sideline, okay? The reason we do that is because we tell our skill on the outside to attack the outside shoulder of the defenders, okay? So if he's running to the hash, if these sees that these guys are jumping outside the blocks, because they don't, they're trying to fight pressure with pressure, then he can stick his foot in the ground and get up the hash. But if he's reading this this first first uh, defender right here, if he sees that, he's going to jump and shred the hash. If he sees that we get a hook right here, now he's continuing hash number sideline, um, trying to get outside. All right. Um. So that, that's that's bash right there. Uh, I fell in love running bash. Uh, she was 2000 and 2021, the spring, 21, the spring season we had uh, here in North Carolina. We ran it. Uh, we had one linebacker that read guards, and we had another linebacker that read the running back. So this linebacker, okay, was reading the running back. When he sees the running back go to the right, he goes to the right. We have this Mike that's reading this, this guard, he runs to the right. Well, they run into each other, and there's absolutely nobody in the middle of the field. And we don't score, but we get like 20 yards in the play. And I was like, I will always run bash. Um, but that's just a little story over there. Um, all right, another variation. Toss read. Um, it's essentially the bash again because the back's going away. But instead of actually reading the back across, we're going to have them on the, on the back side, and we're going to run almost like speed option. Um, it's not, you're not attacking the DN. You're kind of shuffling out, and you can either pitch or you can run it. And I have clips on all these on my show. So, um, but reading this DN, he goes outside. All right, boom, foot in the ground, go. He comes back inside. Now I'm just going to toss it out. And we're doing a lot with this DN. Okay, we're we're going to kick him with a Y. Okay, we're going to kick him with a running back. We're going to read him inside out. We're going to read him outside in. What I mean by that is, like on bash, if the running back, if, if the end goes out, and the quarterback's running it. If the, if the rain goes in, the running back's running it. Well, now on this one, if the running back goes, if the end goes out, the quarterback's running it still, but he's running a different way. If it goes inside, the running back's still getting outside, right? So it's just giving the DN something different to look at uh, and stuff like that. Uh, and then the last one we're talking about is good old GH counter. Um, you know, I know, I know the, the diagram, the, the letters are different on this, but just different looks right here. So instead of having the tackle pool, maybe you don't have a tackle that can pull, right? Maybe you don't, right? So better to get your steel guy to go ahead and pull. So 
everybody's doing the exact same thing. Only people that change is changing the responsibilities of the tackle and, the, and, the, and your skill guy, sniffer, up back, whatever you want to call him. He's he's going to pull and wrap. He's going to sit there and just pick an inch and get his backside to see gap. But we'll change. We want to do same side. We want to do cross the back. We'll go pistol. However you want to look, uh, you can do some motion, under center, whatever you want to do. You can get so multiple with, with before you put your running back with counter, right? So those are the five variations, GT, quarterback GT, bash GT, toss read GT, and then just go to old GH. Um, so from there, I am going to pull up huddle, and we're going to watch a little film. So hope the film looks good, um, and I'm going to try and go slow um, so it doesn't look horrible. This up here. All right. So, if you're if anybody's familiar with North Carolina high school football, um, so this is North Carolina. I was there two years ago. Well, this it was technically last year, but it was two years ago. Season was. This is Mount Airy. They are back to back state championships in one A, and uh, they're a buzz song. We ran into it, but we ended up getting a good play on this right here. So, this right here is just GT to the left. Okay, so we're gonna get your double teams here. Block back, kick, and wrap, just like that. Uh, and this is a this is a two by two, I mean, it's three by one formation right here. So um, we are in a, we're going to read a guy, but we're going to read thirty two right here. It goes slow, so we'll show. So we are reading this guy. The quarterback could have easily pulled it and got outside, but we didn't. Okay, so. Trap, whoever's the first guy off the, off, off the end of the line of scrimmage is going to end up being this guy. And the second puller is rapping, okay, for who he declared as number one. Right there. And you run straight through him. Let the running back make you right. So you straight thick through him. He can go there. He could have cut here. Because we would have got a guy right here, right? So he could have cut it just as easily in the middle. But let the running back be a running back and make the lineman right. Then it pays to have good running backs. So I'll show it again. Just like that. Okay. GT counter. All right. So now we're going to talk about uh, a little bit of Q real quick. So same thing. We're going to run Q counter to the right. And we're going to have the back fake across and pick up the end. You know, they're going there, and we're trapping and wrapping. All right. So the double team. Double team is caught up in here. The tackle is now he's working there, okay? And now he, the, the, the backside tackle is wrapping for that guy. I know you guys can see this. I'm just trying to compensate it as it happens. And so we don't have end zone shots, guys. We're we were a one A school, and, and we don't have uh, an end zone shot. So, I apologize for that. I also, want to talk about we'll talk about um, when when teams try to spill versus box with their ends in a second, but they do try to spill here. And when I tell them, guys, I try even though they're spilling, try to still get inside and kick because we like to pull really tight. But if, it's, if, if we get to the point where, hey, we can't, we'll, we'll lock him for sure. Okay? But on this one, he still kicks him, ends up getting a pancake, and it works out. So sometimes you can't sometimes you can't just still kick, guys. Sometimes you have to lock him. And uh, in one of, the, one of the clips in a second, you're going to see that. Okay? All right, this is a pretty clear picture right here. So this is that heavy look with the quarterback counter. Um, so what we're going to have here is this guy walked up, Okay. And so we're going to double this guy. We're going to show him we'll double him. Okay, we're working back. We're going to trap whoever shows off the edge. Just like old school trap, we're going to get two for one, let the other outside guy get caught in the trash and pull for the next one, okay? We're going to pull an edge. He actually came back off the line of scrimmage. Okay, we pull for the next wrong colored jersey. That's why I use that terminology a lot. Wrong colored jersey. You come around here, 
It might not. It might be him, him, him. It might be the referee. It doesn't matter to me. You bought the first wrong color jersey. So big seventy three. He comes around. All he sees is green. Go block green. Awesome. Now we have a huge, you know, window right there to go score a touchdown. Okay. So I love running heavy. Like get, you ain't bring all your defenders in the box. We're gonna bring our guys in the box. Let's go win, right? And all my defensive guys are like, yeah, let's do that. But it is what it is. All right. Here we go. Best play in football. So we're going to run Ride right here. And ride for us is just our, our bash concept. So now we have our H-back in here in the box. And we're going to run Ride this way. He's going to arc into the alley. But we're going to read, okay? The No, excuse me. Wait. Yeah, okay, we're good. So we're going to read this guy. Arc here, pull, and go that way. This actually ends up getting, being a pull read. And the quarterback gets a lot. I'm going to show the whole run. I'll show it fast. Hopefully, Zoom is showing it good. And they pay to have good players, right? All right. So, they, a lot of them, let's see. One, two, three, jump out to the side, uh, jump outside. So they have one, two, three, four to my one, two, three, four, and then we got numbers. I'm going to get my double team on this six, number six right there. All right. Right again. He's going to he, the, the back's going to the right. We're going to the left. Those steel guys out here. Take the outside shoulder. He takes too long to attack the outside shoulder. But if he goes ahead and gets here, he goes ahead and he either he kicks or wraps right there, he can get right there, right? But receivers, right? So running back, make us right. Trap. Even if we had run it inside, I think the quarterback could have scored. Could have scored. Who knows, right? So, best thing about Bash is you got stretch going this way, and you got all these guys going that way. And ignore my diagrams. I'm just playing around. All right. So, this is, this is ride right here again. Great. You can outflank these guys to the outside, right? He comes and he just sits. Well, if he's sitting, give it to him, or you can pull it, right? That'd be a uh, perfect read on this. Not gonna lie to you guys, we were, we were way better than this team, so I'm not gonna lie to you. But give it outside and let them go make a play. All right, I'm not gonna embarrass teams. All right, this is the last last bash clip I got right here. Yep, this is a quarterback pulling. Okay, so we're gonna run GT to the right, bash to the left. This is a good one with uh, with the H back blocking alley back or safety alley. Anybody there? He should be there and there. So he should. So the next we are inside the box now blocking him. All right, quarterback felt he could run it. Well, he can. Great seventy five. Good block right here. Finish. Awesome. Love it. This is not a this is not a, a offensive line finishing clinic, but. I try to coach this as best I can. Just go finish the guys. All right, here we go. Here's Toss. So I guarantee you what happens here, we, we do check sometimes, is that we had ride on and coach didn't like it. Okay, so we changed it. So we end up flipping the back and running a roll. Okay. So we end up changing. He flips, he flips around. Great. So run GG to the left, toss to the right. Now, on this one, the quarterback looks like he's just straight tossing it because he knew that this DN was not going to run out. I mean, not gonna, not gonna, he's not going to go outside. So he just tosses it out there. Right? Get your skill guys out there running. 
but we can still run GT on the inside. This was a spill team. This is what we're talking about. We're talking about some spill stuff. He's going to go inside, right? The wrong arm. So we have to log. I'm going to mute myself real quick, maybe. Real quick. Sorry, I cough. So we're going to log it, and we're going to end up getting whoever is outside next. Okay. Later on in the game, came right back to it. This is when he does read. Let your quarterback be a salesman, man. Be a salesman. He ain't looking at this kid. He can see him. If even if we toss it out, I think we still got to play outside. But he goes and brings it back inside. Okay. And it pays to have good players. So log. Go to the next one. Especially when they go and they spill and they don't have anybody to come off the edge. But who you spilled it too? Okay, uh, here we go. So this is the GH now. Same thing, obviously the same team. So they're going to spill it. Okay, he's going to be the spill player. And the way we run this is I put this on Twitter not too long ago. So we're going to log him, trap him, cut back north. I'm real big on real big on selling outside with the running back and then cutting up. Coach, you got a handful of minutes left. All right, thank you. All right. Um, and then, yeah, GGT is going to be GH as well. All right, that's back at the top. All right, so um, essentially, guys, yeah, that, that, I'm just trying to show clips of some counter clips. Um, let me go back to here. Well, um, yeah, if we have anybody has any questions, guys, you definitely 100% hit me up. Um, I'm on, obviously, I'm on Twitter, uh, the YouTube as well. It's my email, my phone number. Please do not hesitate to reach out, hit me up. Um, I'll talk ball about anything and everything. Uh, I don't know everything, but I know a little bit. And obviously, you see, we, we run this stuff. So, definitely 100% uh, holla at me for sure. Hey, I, I, a couple of questions. Uh, really, it's like one sort of two questions. I mean, one, I mean, for Bash and for your like toss look, is there any like looks you prefer that against? Um, forefront, yeah, out um, front, certain coverages. Like, ha, like when you're looking at calling the bash and the toss stuff, what do you look kind of? What's your main things you're looking for? Um, really, I'm looking to see what that defensive end does first. Um, on the backside, can we seal him with like we're running GT normally, and we have like an H to just seal him, seal the backside end off. If he's Spill, he's uh, he's uh, cutting off the backside tackle, getting in his hip pocket and running down the line of scrimmage on the pools. All right, well, then we need to go and we need to start reading that dude because he's going to try, he's trying to chase us from the backside. Um, so really, the DN kind of tells us what we want to do, um, with the backside guy. Uh, and we can, like I said, we can read him, we can bash him, we can toss off of him, all sorts of things. Also, that, um, if we go like trips. Right, and they're say they're a four four team, and they have two over three uh, to the trip side, and the back side alley is 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 closed, and there's somebody there. Then we'll go ride or or toss to the side we have three or three on two. Right, is um I can pull this up real quick. I can draw it up like this. So, uh, not this. Really. Uh, so. If we go out here and let's say they give us a look like this, they split two and three, great. Now we have numbers out on the edge, right? Um, conversely, if it, it, like look that I gave, it's like this, all right? Well, now we have nobody on this alley, so we should have numbers to run this side. So definitely looking where are their guys, you know, how they line up to trips, because um, this is a great 10 personnel run. Um, for us, we don't have any 10 personnel runs because we are so good, so gap scheme. 
Um, so we'll definitely do it like this as well. Uh, when, uh, so let's say it's odd front, uh, I didn't even get into how we block odd front, but I only got three minutes. But um, we arc our tackle when it's odd front. Uh, and I'll just kind of put this all up here real quick. Um, uh, let's just to do whatever, just real quick. So we'll arc this guy, we'll arc him, we'll, we'll do uh, ace, ace the nose right here, there, and then we will trap the four technique and go there. So now and we'll bring him in. Arc there. And so now you will read this four technique, right? So this this four to this tackle, uh, we can't get this four technique out of out of this uh B gap, right? He's just spiking B gap. Well now we'll, we'll read the four technique. We love doing that. Um and then we'll end up arcing for the out the overhang or whoever it may be. Um outside right and then more than likely if he's going b gap he's going to be c gap so we end up trapping him and then the quarterback or the running back whoever's responsible for outside will cut up off of this h block so we we, we like it against any situation to be honest with you but definitely if the dn is just nosy he's squeezing this puller we'll definitely do it like that okay all right, coaches. Well, again, uh, as Coach wraps up here and uh, Coach Hall starts sharing his screen, uh, don't hesitate to check out Coach uh, Coach's uh, YouTube channel, his Counterculture podcast, um, his Twitter. I'm probably forgetting stuff. Like I said, coaches. Um, I mean, he's all over the place and does a great job at helping the community. Um, so don't hesitate. If you got any further questions, to reach out to Coach. Um, and then, like I said, if you missed any of it or want to check out any of it, you could um, swing back and uh, the replay will be available. And then at, hopefully by Tuesday, um, I'll have it cut up and each individual clinic will be on here and it's on a little playlist as well. But again, don't hesitate to check out Coach's YouTube channel um, and check out his podcast. I think there, there are several episodes in. Um it's a, I mean, I do like the counter, the name counterculture. Um, I'm not giving up mine for that, though. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. Thank, uh, thank you, Coach. Yes, sir. Appreciate y'all. Y'all have a good day. Coach Hall, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Well, coaches, so we stay on time. Um, I'm going to just kind of move, move quickly from one to the other. Uh, Coach has shared his screen so we can kind of get moving. Um but Coach uh, Chris Hall is the DB's coach um, at Louisville High School in Texas. Uh, coach is going to talk some of their match coverage and kind of what they do. Uh, coach Coach reached out to me, and um, like I said, they do some good things down there. It's a very good football program down there in the great state of Texas. Um, but Coach is going to kind of talk what they do with match coverage. And uh, Coach, the floor is yours. Well, thank you for inviting me. Just on behalf of Michael Oldo and the whole defensive staff at Louisville, we just want to say thank you for letting us kind of come on and share what we do. We're really proud of what we have built here at Louisville and, you know, welcome to share anything that we've learned over the last couple of years as a staff. Um, by the way, we feel we have a really strong staff, not just as a defense coordinator, but our defensive line coach, you know, Gabe McLaughlin, our D, you know, linebackers coach, Robert Lewis, and, you know, rest of the staff, you know, Bobby Watkins and, you know, Jane Wright, they just do a fantastic job. And, I'm sorry, I forgot. Uh, uh, Tracy Fight, also Coach D Line. They just do a great job, which makes my job really easy on the back end to try to cover up because we have some really good players. So I'm going to go fast. Um, I have a lot of diagrams for you today, and then we'll get some video. So I'm going to jump in and out of program. So I hope everybody can see the screens. If any time it doesn't let you see it, just let me know. But, you know, I firmly believe in building a toolbox. And what I mean by that is giving kids the ability to play football in a way that they're in control of their situations when they're on the field. And so what I mean by that, when we start teaching quarters, the first concepts we'll get into is talking to them about understanding that when we're playing our quarters concepts, that we're building a square, we're building a box. And then we want to be a four over three principle, uh, be plus one in the passing game, maybe a little light box in the run game at times, but understanding that we want to put our defensive backs in a position where we can double team, uh, where we can do things called brackets and do other things to, if you will, take away receivers that may give you trouble. 
um, when you're facing RPOs or other types of concepts where good players can get you in some bad spots. So, you know, one of the first tools we'll give them is just like seven mag. Um, everybody's seen the saving system. It's what we build our system out of here at Louisville. And, you know, what we're saying when we're playing any of our seven rules is it's still quarters. Our safety is still reading two to one with robber principles. Um, but it's just what we're doing in number two. So, if, you know, we're playing right here. Our overhang is all of number two, unless he gets a fast something, you know, it's unless something principles, right? And our corners are playing MEG, which just stands for man and where he goes we'll give them another toolbox but we'll get them into other things and you know as you can see here um you know with meg and then mod you know we can be in an off principle right whether if you will playing from a press or a bail um and we just try to give them a pool or, or a toolbox where you know i know you can go back and watch these videos and then go through these notes and diagrams i'll have some others to show you but what I'm just trying to establish is you would just give these kids a set of tools so that we really don't build, a, even though we run a bunch of coverages, they just run a bunch of, if you will, techniques. And we allow the techniques in which we build in these kids to be, if uh, you know, kind of the scheme that we build. So um, we always talk about in spring football right now, we're just teaching technique, technique, technique. So the slides I just went through very quickly, you know, as a corner, he's going from being mag, you know, he's mess, mod. And just learning those techniques and applying those pattern matching rules over and over and over again. Um, that strong safety is playing a read two to one quarters principles, right? He's a robber. Um, he's not a real aggressive backpeller out there. He's a slow to go guy. We use a baby scooch to kind of slow him down in tempo routes. But it's really who are we asking number two to be handled by? You know, if we want number two to be handled by the, if you will, the corner, we can play some type of this concept you see on the screen here, which is a palms comp set where we're allowing the corner to kind of hang and read number two to the flat. If we want it to be more aggressive with our overhang and have him match to the flat, you know, to the flat, we'll play like you see here, mod, right? And it's just what we're asking our overhangs and safeties and corners and our linebackers to that side, again, four over three box principles, how we're going to work together and how we can put ourselves in a good situation. Now, we don't run all these calls in a game. You know, what we do is we pick the menu that we want to run. And then from there, you know, we decide what we want to do with a game plan. Um, today, I don't really want to talk to you about box quarter principles. I really like to talk to you about our quarters aggressive double team principle, which we call cones. And, you know, a lot of people have, you know, different variations or concepts of what they believe cones and brackets are. Yes, we run brackets. Um, what brackets are to us is when you see us running what we would call stubby in a minute, where our star overhang is all of number two and less three is fast out. So it's different than when you're playing a double team, which we're talking about here with our cones. So yes, we have brackets in our seven system, but we also have what we call cones and we like to differentiate those between each other where I don't know if a lot of programs do that. Sometimes they keep cones and brackets kind of the same because it's an in and out kind of principle, but we like for our players to, excuse me, kind of separate and kind of put those learning uh, kind of categories into buckets. So they understand that when we're asking them to play brackets, they're doing certain things. When we're asking them to play boxes, they're doing certain things. And as you're going to see here, when we ask them to play cones, it's asking them to do something completely different because what cones are, are an aggressive double team. In this situation here, you're seeing one of our Indian calls. And what that means is that we're aggressively doubling the inside receiver. The techniques that we teach the players are the boomer technique with the star, which means he is OU. He has number two out and up the field. He is the top piece of this man double team, meaning if that H runs a vertical seam down the seam or up the field, we expect the star to be on top, which means that that star is out of the run game. He cannot be, if you will, involved in the run game if you have to carry someone vertical. And that's something we'll get into just a little bit with the run game, is that when you ask someone to carry someone vertically in the run game or, or in the pass game, you can't ask them to be involved in the run game. So we tell them this, your coverage will always match your alignment. So align to cover and you'll be right. And the next thing is always, if you're carrying someone vertical, you do not have a run fit. So in this situation, the star doesn't have a run fit. And we're in, if you will, double team with that strong safety and that star. I can get some techniques later with that strong safety. He's old school slam stepping and he's playing a Hoosier technique, which means he has him inside and up. So any inside breaking route, like a shallow crosser, he'll come off that roof and that star will fox the post and start snaking the dig because we feel like any time that you've made us where we don't have to believe you're going to go four verticals and quarters, we can close the middle of the field with some type of fox or snake principle and look from the backside and poach some routes as if we can still some, if you will, middle of the field closed principles like we were hearing talked earlier, which was a fantastic talk.
you know, I just want to give a shout out to, you know, what the coach Roberts did earlier when his covered three principles, you know, we're just trying to close the middle of the field as well when we're in quarters, because like what he was saying, what it gives you visually in the defense. The next thing we also do is just we can change leverage. So it's like week to week. And we'll show you when we played Allen here a couple of years back when they had a really strong kind of slot receiver, big and physical. We didn't like the matchup of having the star outside and the strong safety inside. So we went to a switch, right, in the old seven switch worlds, which we called Savage, so it matched our Indian coverage. And we're just changing the leverages of the Boomer and the Hoosier. So now the star is the Hoosier. He has him inside and up, and he is the underneath piece, where now the strong safety is the top piece being the one who is outside and up playing the Boomer technique. Um, I, you know, you can go back and hit pause and pattern match and see all the things that we're doing down here um, for all the routes to go with this coverage. Um, and that's one thing is that we like to tie this Indian with an outlaw. So just like the Indian starts with the inside word, we're going to double team the inside receiver. The outlaw outward gives us the ability to do the same thing on the backside. Now, um, this puts a lot of pressure, as you see on our inside linebackers. They're going to play what's called a bongo technique. We'll show you some details about. But what we're again trying to do is we're trying to eliminate the vertical RPO threats in today's modern offenses by creating aggressive double teams on the inside and outside receivers of these two back offenses that are trying to create RPO and run gap scheme situations so that we need Sam and your, sorry, we need our interior linebackers um, to be in the box, but also having safeties kind of Braveheart Terminator, which I'll get a little bit being cover to action or action to cover principles so that we can sling the fits, kind of slow it down and try to keep these double team cones on these receivers as we're trying to also fit the run game. Um, I'm not going to get into any other shape, so I'm again try to stop that slide, and I'm going to go to a new slide. So my new share, um, I'm going to go to real quick, is going to be just the seven Indian, you know, pattern matches. Um, you know, the thing I think about, you know, um, when you're talking coverage is just how you're pattern matching, right, and how you're putting things together. And, you know, so what here you see is one of our base test calls. Um, uh, when we get two back formations, you know, we're going to be playing Indian on one side, outlaw on the other, and using our double teams. You can see the bongo in action, right? You can see those blue and green lines having to match that backfield. So having to use indicator eyes and being able to play two man light box principles. And that's why we got to do things up front and play gap and a half because we're really trying to be stack track fallback. Um, all those terms you hear when we sling in our fists because we're really trying to slow things down, make things roll off the table. Um, so that we can be late in the run fit and try to play seven man run spacing as much as we can. Um, the next diagram that I'm going to show you, I'm sorry, let me get going. Sorry. Sorry, my screen's there. There it goes. Let me go back one. So I jumped on my screen. So the next one is, you know, this is just that they were to attach that tight end, right, and get into 11 personnel things. Um, this is a Bronco check that I stole way back from Gary Patterson when he was at TCU. Um, you can see many, many things online. These are the same rules that we apply uh, when you see his Bronco coverage, when he's using his split safety quarters principles. Um, so we're doing the same thing. Um, we will play some outlaw. So at times when you go visit other colleges and universities, you're going to see them playing outlaw on that outside receiver. But, you know, just to kind of go quicker so I can get you into more diagrams and film, um, you can see that we check stubby, play outlaw on the backside of the tray. Um, anytime it's three by one, we'll be stubby. We can play cloud. We can play different concepts. Um, but again, the main idea is that we're playing, if you will, cone aggressive double teams and allowing our defense to kind of be a light box fit and try to start the RPO and force the offense to, um, to move the ball down the field um, as slowly as we can, to make them run as many plays as we can efficiently and things like that. So there's some of the boot rules and different things as well. So again, I'm going to stop my share and bounce around real quick and uh, move from different things and different presentations, if you will. Me, um, You know, I think one of the things that I think is so important is, um, you know, when you're playing these coverages and you're playing these concepts, Sorry, I lost you guys real quick. Um, the next screen I wanted to show to you, Coach. I'm sorry. Uh, You're good. Apologize. It's going to be seen. Um, is the PowerPoint. Are you able to see the PowerPoint right now? No, I just you, nothing is currently shared on our end. All right. So I feel like I've lost the share. I don't know if you can help me out real quick. Um, let's see. Share my screen. Um, let me. I think I fixed yep. it. Sorry, my internet's kind of jumping around. Are you seeing that now? Yeah, you're good. 
All right, coach. So like guys, I want to just get to you real quick. And again, I'm going to go real fast through this. You know, this is just kind of how we fit the run. All right. So the thing is we're trying to do is use terminating brave hop principles off this boomer and this Hoosier concepts of how we can slow down the run fit and use our linebackers and using gap and a half principles up front so that our linebackers know that when those double teams start to climb, we can fall back into the run game. And again, fit it like seven man run spacing when it comes to our mindsets. So I'm just going to, again, kind of go through this quickly. I know you guys can go back and hit pause and watch this. Um, get a hold of me at any time you want to talk. But that way, allow I can get a little bit of the film and you can kind of see this stuff in action, um, which is, again, why you, most of you kind of come to these clinics. You know, you know the diagrams, you know the schemes. Um, but, you know, being able to see this stuff run um, at the high school level is what, you know, really we're trying to do here. So the last thing I'm going to do then is I'm going to get into the film. Um, you know, the thing I think that's so important about what we try to do again at Louisville is that, you know, we try to the very best we can to coach these kids, um, you know, to be in a college defense, you know, and I know that sounds crazy to a lot of people, um, but, you know, we take great pride in that. Um, again, can you all see my screen again? Yes, sir. All right. So, you know, the thing I think is, again, we're calling these do uh, two on one doubles, but, you know, when you go to college practices and when our kids have left our program, they're running these coverages and these cone concepts. And we feel that by being able to categorize these techniques in the buckets, we're able to do these things. So like the boomer technique, this is something we will use when we're running our rip list match principles. When we play more of a, if you will, match cover three, unlike coach Roberts talked about earlier, we're more of a rip list match cover three. So our overhangs just have to use the boomer technique when they're playing the rip list this match cover three middle of the field close defenses we use the hoosier technique again it's an inside and up portion allowing you to understand i'm underneath and being the if you will more in the run, kind of the run fit but you know like we showed you just being late so let's just kind of show you some film this is from this year this is again um you know us playing the 20 personnel what we call america's offense you can see the techniques labeled out there for you um, as you let it play in action, as you can see, we're getting that good double team right there on that slot, the good double team on the backside X. We're in man to man coverage out there. And you can see we have the ability to take away what they're trying to do. Right. And be aggressive with our principles and then gain foxes and snakes. Right. And then get the middle of the field close defenses that you like to see, even though you're playing light box principles. One of the things you have to understand is that we are a man free team as well. So we teach kids how to play man match, right? So if you're going to play man match quarters, you better be able to be, if you will, willing to play man free and teach these men how to play leverage on receivers, using dividers, if you will, using position maintenance and knowing how to help and if you will give help based on what the quarterback and the route patterns are giving you. The next thing I want to show you is just when it goes into motion, a two by two, it just turns into a palms read on the backside. But notice down here at the Indian first, that inside breaking route, the Hoosier now takes that inside breaking route. The boomer is going to fox the post. And when our other safety feels that, he kind of sloughs off and he has the ability to, if you will, close the middle of the field, start double teaming. And we're gaining, if you will, eyes and we're daily, if we will, being able to be the aggressor on defense because we're allowing our eyes and our coaching progression and teaching progression to allow kids to play at a high level, we feel like, because we work this, if you will, from man free all the way through their coverages to quarters. Also, again, keep going fast with the film. This is a 11 personnel book. This was the clip I was telling you about Allen Eagles. That's slot receiver. And what you're seeing there, that's Hawkins, a fantastic football player. We're making his first read gone. And a quarterback, no offense, he's great, but making him become, you know, Brady and go from inside to outside to throw the numbers. As you can see, that's an advantage to us. We made him play with his, if you will, left hand. And that's what we try to promise our kids with this stuff is whatever tool we got to put together. Again, today we're talking at seven Indian, but whatever tool in that toolbox we had earlier, we'll go through that toolbox each week and try to give ourselves the best, if you will, situation against our opponents. Going to give you a nub trips motion to pro twins, right? So what you're going to notice here is it's a great coverage against screens in passing situations because your linebackers are in man coverage. You'll notice that by the motion, it's going to bring our backer back into the box. He's going to stick his eyes out and tell you, I'm on that back. The seven's a really good player. He's back there for a reason. And we're able to be in man coverage, even though we're playing these double team light box principles. And if you will, serious third and six, because this is third and six, you know, this is a good call for us. Again, pro twins against the Allen Eagles. You're going to notice right here, 
just the ability to take on the screen on first down. So I showed you being a great call on third down. Yeah, coach, you call it on third down. Yeah, we call it on first down too because of the eyes and the leverage it gives our players to be, if you will, in a good position to be athletic. Excuse me. This year against Highland Park, this is what I love about this. You'll notice when the play stalls, it's a third and 18 clip. Look at us playing the sticks. Look at the leverage of the defensive backs. All, if you will, upfield foots are almost about to be planted at the same time, ready to break on the quarterback's intentions. And we, again, are doing some really fun stuff. You know, I talked to you guys about Coach McLaughlin and Coach Lewis, Coach Fight, those guys in the front. Look at the presentation we're giving them, right? And we're just playing our principles that we work every day in our, if you will, pass Kelly. And just getting the quarterback, if you will, to if you will move a little bit and give our eyes a chance to break on the football and allow our great players to be great. Two by two, again, doubles, Indian on your right side, palms on your left, pattern matching, sticking their feet in the ground at this third and 12, sitting on the sticks, and again, breaking on the football and being in a confident top leverage, top shoulder position against our opponents. Here again is number seven against Prosper. We showed him in the backfield around the screen. We get him in the backfield, so we change it from our normal palms. We switch this to Savage so that the strong safety or sorry, free safety coming down is playing a boomer technique now, and now that inside backer is playing the Hoosier. And when you, you see we're double-team coning the guy that they really want to throw the ball to so we can take the guy that they want away and make them play left-handed. See the presentation that Coach McLaughlin and Coach Lewis, Coach Fight, and them are developing, changing and messing up protections and trying to get a four-man pass rush as effective and, if you will, as control the pocket as we can, what we like to consider controlled chaos. Two-by-two two doubles, parts out. Now we have to have system built-in checks, right? We have to have a system that's built in that our kids can handle situations. So this is our pyramid check to stacks so that we're going to be able and always to be double teaming the deepest inside route. And if you will, gain in stock or snakes and boxes again, just based on the fact that if, uh, you know, we have the ability to work two to one based on what the receivers are getting. Yes, we are a nickel based defense, so we can use our overhangs different. The thing about it is it's multiple, so if you give us fib, we can super rotate. We'll just play four mod like you saw in the toolbox earlier, so that's a star, so that we can play the boot out with Mr. Hawkins, who's a fantastic player, just not allowing the offense to put our defense in a situation that's not a good situation. You know, I feel like so many times when I was a young football coach, we – we're so rule-based. Our rules actually hurt us at times, even though they kept us, if you will, to alignment, stance, key responsibility, all those great things. But it also limited our ability to be flexible. You know, I'm a big Bruce Lee fan. You know, the tree that breaks in the wind are the stiff branches. The ones that flow like you know, have that ability to bend and evolve um, are the guys that are going to play good defense. And as coaches, I think we've got to evolve too. our ever evolution as coaches and how we're doing things. So I was telling you, I'll show you some of the run fits. I know I'm close on time. I'm flying down there. But, you know, the thing it does, guys, it doesn't put us in RPO conflict. So no offense to offensive coaches, but when you put yourself where you're not having overhangs in the run fit and you're allowing your players to play pass or run, not run or pass based on what they see, not having to read off a key, play with man eyes, it allows you to play this 20 personnel hybrid RPO offense. And that's Hawkins, guys, a fantastic player. And that was our game plan, as you can see against team. We didn't as I say we want you to run the ball, Mr. Hawkins, but what we didn't want him to have is the ability to stretch us, if you will, laterally as he attacked us vertically. Here it is to more of a 21 personnel look. So, again, I'll get to the box view. You know, right here you have number nine, a tight end on the right, number eight, a tight end on the left. This is a 21 personnel look, and we're fitting the box with six players. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine on six. I mean, or, sorry, it's just a, a crazy number system we're trying to succeed in. But you can see the techniques and the things that we're playing with, and it's still allowing our defense to be aggressive against the RPO. I think you'll really like this clip here. Again, notice that eight offensive guys in the core. We have six defensive guys in the core. And so when the play develops, you can see right here that because of what Coach McLaughlin teaches with our gap and a half techniques and being a thick and punch, you know, peak and punch guys and striking and falling back into gaps that allows us to keep players out of the fit and insert guys as needed and play light boxes down after down after down. Again, you can see right here, eight on six, 20 personnel. Here's the play. 
and we're able with technique, stack track, fall back, and have the overhang come in late because we understand our fits and how the ball is going to roll off the table when we're getting so certain looks. So I'll finish with this clip right here. Again, eight on six. Um, and then again, why we're we doing this is because if you give us two removed receivers, we're playing three over two. We're forcing you to try to do things that we feel like are unconventional, which is continually run the football when that's not something they always practice. They all in practice, they pull it, they throw the RPO. We feel if we're making them do something off rhythm that gives our players advantage. We got toolbox sets to handle formations, um, just so we don't ever put our kids in a bad spot. So I know I talk fast, and I know I went fast. That's two minutes, you know, into my time. I got the, I think I got three minutes left for questions, but. You know, we just love what we do at Louisville. We love how we do it. Um, we think we give our kids a, you know, a chance. And again, if you would like to get with me anytime, um, we certainly can. As you can see, you know, we have a, a huge library of things that we like to teach. And, you know, we can also, you know, show you how we teach this. So not only do we talk about being a boomer technique, um, but you can see on the screen, we can talk to you about how we teach scooch slot man technique, how it's an off catch and just into the drills and all the things that we talk about. Uh, when it gets in, because again, our idea is to build the techniques, the techniques that become the defense that we use. And then week to week, yeah, we have a big Waffle House menu defense, but we get a good little lunch menu put together and we go to work on Monday and we coach that stuff up and our kids play hard for us. And we're very lucky to be Louisville Fighting Farmers. Well, coach, I will say fantastic job. My phone was blowing up as you were speaking to people just sending me messages. So great job. I mean, like, I do have I do have one question. Unless somebody puts something in the chat, then I'll we'll add from there. Um, but like when you're, how I'll phrase it this way: How from your technique standpoint, how much do they build off each other, or how much? Because I'm assuming most of your kids are one way. Um, yes. So so how much they are, build off are, each other completely? So for instance, our corners start off playing press man technique. That's a technique they're going to use when they're playing Indian, they're in Meg, and they're OYO on your own. So they understand how to play press man. We play bump press man technique. That stars, you can see right now on my screen, I'm showing you our stars practicing a scooch. Now we use this scooch when we're playing seven Indian. We use this scooch when we're playing Rip and Liz match cover three. We also use this scooch when we're playing on the hash as a baby tempo scooch when we're playing palm. So we don't have, if you will, a hard deck when we're playing palms or two read. We get bat, 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 if that receiver is vertical past that landmark, I don't care if he's in or out or overhang, that's too great for me as a coach. He's vertical, we turn it into mod. Um, and again, you know, everything that we teach in our defense, we teach every kid how to do it. So, this is you can see just us right here, just working the scooch. And you know, all the techniques that we teach, just like you said, go into all of our coverages. So, we play match, we play cover one, rap, right? We play match cover three. We play these all these quarters, brackets, tools, and then we would play the Mary Harden Baylor Tampa 2 vision, right? And then we can get into some zebra cover three, you know, based on if we get true 21 personnel coach, I'm not going to play Ripley's match. We're going to play zebra principles, and we're going to get true seam curl flat defenders and reroute and do all the things that Coach Roberts talks about. But I think it's what you said. It's the scaffolding. Um, but it's the experience in this defense and the ability to say how long we've been running this defense and running these coverages, how long I've been doing it. I think it's the teaching progression. This is what we do day one, page one. And when we start in the off season, we're building the techniques so that when we put in stubby coverage, we tell that overhang star, hey, man, you're playing scooch catch man on number two. You're all a number two unless three is fast. Well, where did you learn that, kid? Well, when you were playing your rip list match cover three rules, when you had all of two out and up with three fast rules in your rip list match, we just layer it. Okay, perfect, coach. Well, um, as coaches uh, – Finishing up here, and as we kind of get ready for our next speaker, a um, couple things. Um, one, coach did a great job. If you need to get a hold of him, um, you can easily fo follow him on Twitter, X, whatever you want to call it. Um, doesn't really matter, to be honest. Um, but coach is on there at Coach C Hall. Um, so you can get a hold of coach there. Um, I, I mean, coach have already kind of talked about him coming back possibly next month because I'll say. I'll be at least doing these monthly through the spring. So I've kind of talked to him a little bit. Well, I got to narrow down some dates and some other stuff. And then me and him will talk from there. But coach did a great job. And like like he said, if you want more detail on anything he did, because he threw a lot out there in a 25-minute period, um, do not hesitate to reach out to coach, uh, to contact coach, and kind of uh, go from there. Thanks, coach. 
All right. Um, and well, Coach Well, we're going to transition, or we're about a minute or two ahead of schedule. So as Coach Wells is kind of getting um, situated here, um, Coach, can you hear me? Yeah, I got you. You got me. Yes, sir. Um, Coach Wells is. Let me make sure I have all my stuff. I don't want to misread this. Uh, coach Wells is the pass game coordinator and quarterback coach at Evangel University in Missouri, correct? Correct. Springfield, Missouri. It's been Springfield, Missouri. Uh, coach is going to talk about changing the quarterback launch po point. Um, my our, our buddy, uh, Coach uh, Ridgeway, I believe, is the one that uh, convinced Coach to um, do this for me. Um, but Coach is going to talk about changing the launch point, and we're going to get started here in a second. Um, again, coaches, um, if you miss any part, this full replay will be on. Um, I'll eventually get these cut up and, and attached individually. Um, do not hesitate to ask questions in the chat, and I will just forward them to coach at the end when we have our last like five to seven minute period. Um, again, we've had fantastic speakers so far. Um, like I said, all three have been really good, and um, I look forward to this one as well. Um, but I mean, we're about a minute ahead of schedule, which is fine. Uh, but coach, you can kind of get started as you're ready. And, um, thank you for coming on. Yeah. Appreciate you having us, man. Uh, really awesome talk right there by coach Hall and everybody that's been for me, uh, really excited about the opportunity to be here and just speak about kind of what we do at Evangel. Uh, we're an NAI program here in Springfield, Missouri, uh, in the KCAC conference, um, got here two years ago. Uh, just a little bit about me. Um, played at Louisiana Monroe, coached at Louisiana Monroe, coached at Jacksonville State uh, prior to that, and then uh, been at Evangel ever since uh, 2022. And so we've had some success here doing some things. I know the one thing that I have never had, and that is uh, consistency up front to find five humongous offensive linemen that's it's easy to sit there and just run the football every single snap at will. And so uh, to me, I believe wholeheartedly that the quarterback's got to be the game changer in the offense. I think you have to do what the quarterback can do uh, from that standpoint. And we like to be able to change launch point. We like to be able to help out our offense to line in the passing game. Last year, we gave up 12 sacks, uh, dropping back 700 and something opportunities. And uh, we, we really believe this is just kind of our philosophy of changing the launch point, our philosophy of moving the quarterback around, our philosophy of using the quarterback. And also I'll talk a little bit about how we change the tempo and how we incorporate just some burst calls there and how we like to control the tempo to be able to also help the quarterback as well. Just some things we look at from quarterback standpoint, uh, we look at is he an overall throw and accuracy, right? That's hard to coach at my level, right? Once he gets to me, he's kind of become a passer at the standpoint of, is he, can he accurately do that? Now, we're going to work that. We're going to throw the targets in everything we do. We're always going to work on accuracy when he's with us. But at the same time, I think it's hard to coach it, right? Is he tough? Does he have courage? Does he have poise in the pocket? Is he tough when he gets knocked down? Can he get back up, right? Will 10 guys around him um, sit there and let them lead? let him lead them, okay? Is he mobile? I don't think he's got to be a 4-4 guy. I think he's got to be able to get out of his own way. And I, I think he's got to be able to create a little bit, right? He's got to be a great decision maker. He's got to be consistent in his decision making, right? And then he's got to have leadership qualities, all those intangible things. And then he's got to, he's got to be clutch in production moments, right? I think how you can improve your quarterback production within your system, I know how we do it within our system are these three things, right? We like to move the launch point whether that be change of protection, whether that be sprint them out, whether that be do some counter stuff, whatever that might be from the dash protection standpoint that we'll talk about here in a second. Uh, we'd like to change the tempo within our offense, whether that be freeze, whether it be look back, whether that be burst calls that we'll talk about here in a little bit, right, or whether that just be naturally going no huddle, right. We like to change up that tempo so we have the pin last and not necessarily give that opportunity to the defense coordinator because we heard in Coach Hall's, Look right. They're going to try to have the best leverage. They're going to have, they're going to try to have the plus one to the box, right? They're going to try to have all those things. We would like to try to change the tempo, like to have control of the tempo in order to keep them on their heels, right? And then also we like to kind of 
dual screen with the quarterback. We like the RPO using the quarterback just so we can buy back and try to create that extra hat and create that extra number, right? Why don't we change the, why don't we change the launch point? We want to eliminate stress on the offensive line. Talked about that. It's hard to find uh, five of them where you can just sit there and say, I'm going to block them and not worry about pressure. We're going to shorten the length of the throw. I know at our level, right, we don't have the guy that can sit there and throw the, throw the outs to the field and sit there in the pocket and make all the throws. So we're going to move him. We're going to shorten the length of the throw. We're going to do those different things to help his arm, right? We're going to simplify the progression. It's going to allow us to cut the field in half at times, right? We're going to move away from anticipated pressure, right? Allows us as a coaching staff to say, hey, we're going to play the percentages here, right? Percentages say they're going to bring it from the boundary. Hey, let's sprint out to the field or, hey, let's open up the offensive line to that pressure, right? Those kind of things. Right. We're going to discourage the pass rush. We're going to discourage the simulated pressure and all the blitz that you see right now in college football. Everybody trying to get to a bare front. Right. And all that simulated pressure stuff. And then we're going to create different angles of attack and passing game on the deep shell. Right. The name of the game in football to me right now is how many explosive plays can we create? And I don't think you can create a great deal of them if you just sit the quarterback back there just in the middle of the pocket and say, hey, come get me. Right, so we're gonna we're gonna create different angles of attack in the passing game by moving our quarterback around and helping us be able to create some time back there in the pocket. Right, the ways we're gonna do that by changing the launch point, we're gonna naked boot. Right, we're gonna do that under center. We're gonna be in gun. We're gonna be in pistol. Right, we're gonna sprint out. We're gonna dash protect. Right, so we're gonna flash away from it with a quick game option into the boundary. Right, if it's not there, then we're gonna work to the field with with our sprint out stuff. And then we're going to pin protect. So we're going to slide and then pin the tight end off the edge or, or the extra hat, whether it be the running back, pin that, and then work to the field as well. So there's some different ways that we can control the edge. We talked about counter earlier in the clinic, right? Talking about controlling the edge with the bash, controlling the edge with the kick out, right? We're trying to control the edge in the passing game, in the sprint out game, all those different things, okay? So we're going to first do that with our naked boot, our Nashville stuff. Okay, so this is true. This is true kind of full slide wide off of our wide zone stuff. We're heavy in the wide zone run game world, right? So this is our true wide zone. So we're going to be full zone to the left here, sell and run to the left, sprint out to the right after the action. Okay, and this is just a basic concept off of it. And so we got one with a mandatory outside release. We have the deep out. We inside release that H. Okay, we're trying to throw it out to the flask get the easy throw. So we're trying to dictate that, that flat defender, hey, go ahead and take the bait, right? If he takes the bait, we should have the outflank right now to drop it down, right? If not, then we can go ahead and work a high-low right there on that on that hook curl player, okay? If that guy talks to the quarterback, he gets out clean on the pocket, okay, we're reading that thing looking to drop it down if it just comes into our face. If not, then we're looking to put stress on that flat defender. If for some reason we get pulled up by the second contained guy, which is usually that straight backer as the Mike linebacker, then we're teaching that drag. He's going to be 10 to 12 on the backside hash, right? And he's looking for a ball right there. Also, I tell that guy, if he wants to get a ball, if you're on the backside drag and you want to get a ball, you better get in the quarterback's vision. Because at the end of the day, if that quarterback's throwing it back across his body, across the middle of the field, right, he's not playing for me. And so – you better fight like Hades to get underneath all the set, all the coverage and get to that backside hash by 10 to 12 in between that second level and third level defender. Okay, here's just a clip of it. We have a lot of action off this motion, so we're just bringing this guy back, trying to show like we have some different kind of wide zone techniques here. We have some post-wheel stuff we'll do here off action. Okay, so we're just bringing this guy. We're scraping him tight. I say strike matches off the hip of the offensive line, coming right into the flats, fast two. Okay, this tight end's on the backside drag, trying to get 10 to 12 on the backside of hash. Okay, now this, this inside receiver is going to stem in, push vertical, right? He's trying to go inside of this, this hook curl, this flat defender, okay, until common sense says, I got to go, right? And so common sense got to override everything in our system because, like Coach Hall says, We've got to be flexible. I don't want these guys. We're rule-based, okay, but common sense overrides everything, right? And I teach them in that manner. They believe it, okay? And at some point, being a ball player is better than anything you can coach, okay? And so at that point, the quarterback knows we're giving it to them right now. Let's let us let the players be players, 
right? And we all know here right now, right? It's about the Jimmys and the Joes, right? The Jimmys and the Joes make the scheme look really, really good. Okay? And we we formate the heck out of people, right? Just like Coach says, if you have a sound defense, we're going to find some some things that we think we do well, and we're going to get you to line up, and we're going to see if we're better, right? But I watched a bunch of dudes running around, and when, when talent meets talent, right, you got to scheme them up from the standpoint of formation. Like, can we just get them to where we, we created our mismatches, right? And so at the end of the day, that's what we're trying to create, that high-low opportunity and get to where the quarterback's reading the same thing and the defense is just seeing something a little bit different pre-snap. Sprint out wise, okay, we'll rodeo and lasso. And this is our true just go to the call, rodeo lasso call here, okay. And so now this is our spot concept. This is when we were at Jacksonville State. And so this is our true high low on it. We're going to clear out with the corner out, okay. Teaching this bag route, he's going to chase the stem of two and sit right underneath it, right. This should happen somewhere between five and six. This flat route, quarterback should snap it just inside leg of the tackle. He should be fast to the flats, okay? Right now, running backs off the edge, okay? And we're just full run two. Now, we'll do a little bit deeper version. I like this on like kind of a third and long opportunity, right? Not really. Uh, they're getting after us pressure-wise. We can't sit back there and get to the sticks, whatever it might be. It's a longer situation. Trying to move to the quarterback, trying to get our good players on the perimeter with multiple opportunities. And you do see people. I don't have clips of it today. Okay, here at Evangel, we've had a, we've had a hard time kind of reaching this thing to the front side. Kind of everything: the right tackle, left tackle, front side tackle, and the look. Okay. And the running backs kind of get into the quarterback, whether it be the quarterback not having enough speed to get on the perimeter or whether it be enough, not enough force to get this, this edge shut down, right? We've gone to the old school kind of block your backside gap, kick, uh, cut off the front side, and just outrun it, okay? Just to kind of get that, that jumble out of our face. Here at Jacksonville State, we had a good opportunity just to get on the edge, okay? We like to do it that way better. But at the end of the day, gave us an opportunity to push it down a little bit, a little bit deeper. This is more of your China concept, just with the speed out version instead of the turn back or the comeback. Okay. Gave us an opportunity just to get out there. Okay. From a dash standpoint, we call it Ringo Lucky. Okay. And then this is just a full slide to the call. Okay. We have a quick game, what we call a gift on the front side. So if they go, go ahead and give it to us, we're going to take it. Okay. And then if they don't, we're going to pump it, let that timing match up with the protection, and then we're going to create a sprint out with some form or fashion of a concept of a combo here. Okay. And so you'll see here, I think at, at Jacksonville State, we were running the hitch. Okay. You can put whatever you want here. Okay. Whatever your quarterback, quite honestly, throws best. And if, if a guy in the odd front or they're kind of floating that body down here uh, on the edge, okay, I personally, like running this, it's a little bit safer with a four-step out, but we threw hitches better. The quarterback had really good timing. He was a tall enough guy that he could see it. So at the end of the day, we just let him throw it. Okay. The great, the great thing about what we do for a living is, hey, I wish I could still play. I don't get to. So we're going to do what this guy can do, right? If that guy likes to throw a hitch better, we're going to throw hitches. If that guy likes to throw a four-step out, we're going to throw four-step outs. Right. Schematically, they both make sense. Timing wise, they both make sense. So at the end of the day, that's what we're going to do. We're teaching that guy, let's go ahead and take it if they give it to us. Right. Everybody says if we can run it for four yards, let's run it for four yards. Right. If we can throw a hitch for four yards, let's throw a hitch for four yards. At the end of the day, okay, we're all trying to go up and down the field and score as many points as possible. Right. And you can see here, a tackle doesn't do a great job getting out to it, but at the end of the day, four step out. That's an easy throw and catch for 11 yards. Okay, now backside's press, so he knows right now probably pre-snap he's not going to take it, but I still have to spend time on it so it all times out, okay? Great job right here. Boom. Tight end collects it. 
quarterback understands that he could have pressure off the edge pre-snap. Okay, he slides up in there, and now we got a switch bird concept with an opportunity for a blind throw up the sideline. Good, easy throw and catch allows us to change the parameter. Okay, we're in great shape. Same thing here, just putting a little eye candy on it pre-snap. So we short motion the tight end down. Don't really love, based off the look, him getting that far down in there. Would have loved for him to square up, understand there could potentially be edge pressure right here. Good. Now we're running true switch choice out here. Okay, So this guy's got an opportunity to get back vertical, more than likely understanding he knows the quarterback's coming to him. Okay. He's going to hook it up, and then once he feels the quarterback threat in his outside, he has the opportunity to work back out, understanding that the guy from the inside working back out has up until 12 to make his decision. If he feels like he can top it, okay, he's going to run the go route. If he does not feel like he can top it, he's going to hook it straight back down. Okay. throw and catch there by the quarterback. Had another look at it. Quarterback read off two. Okay. Takes it. Same thing. Good throw and catch. Okay. You can see here we're running more of a inverted smash. Okay. Just another concept. We're running an inverted smash. So he's got that high shake route. Okay. He's running that turn back. Okay, back to the sideline. So there, you can run whatever combo fits you. You can run post wheel. You can run the the kind of the switch comebacks. You can run the inverted smash. You can run a cell concept. There's a lot of different things that you can do off of this action here. Okay, from a naked pin standpoint, okay, the one I like is just kind of the double move off of the China concept. Okay, so we're just looking to pin protect. So everything's working in the same protection we talked about with the strip okay, that Nashville. Okay, everything's sliding here. Now we're just incorporating that pin protection. Okay, so instead of slam flat or set a slice flat from the other side, we're telling this tight end, hey, you are now in the protection call. Okay, we give him a little addendum from the quarterback standpoint, just because the quarterback tells everybody in our offense what to do. Okay, he gets a little extra addendum to tell him, hey, you are now in this protection scheme. Okay, but all we're trying to do, we're trying to step on the toes of the safety here to the field. Okay. And we're trying to work the double move here. I tell these guys, get square on them, okay, sell it for three, and then exit high to the back pile on them. They've got to understand the two guys that can take this ball away is the backside safety and the boundary corner. Okay, once that, depending on what defense we're playing, okay, once that backside drag goes, he's either going to buy it up, okay, he's either going to buy that backside hash, or okay, the safety is. Okay, that speed and the angle of the exit of this route okay, on the double move has to beat that. Okay, the quarterback will throw you over. Okay, we had a little fun with this one. We put a sixth offensive lineman in in the tight end spot. Okay, had an opportunity. This was this was the only way we were going to get this defensive look versus this versus this defense. And so we had to scheme them up a little bit just because we had an opportunity to be able to make make something happen there. Okay, but at the end of the day, was not there. Okay, quarterback had the flats. He's just going to take it. But right. this was another way we just deemed the dash protection, but we just had, didn't have an opportunity okay, to get it out there in the flats. Quarterback knew he didn't have a gift throw based off the formation that week. Okay, just an easy way to kind of throw it out there in the flats and let our players be players in space. Same thing here. We're just trying to formationally get the look we wanted. Okay. So at the end of the day, this is our pin protection stuff where the tight ends in. Okay. We create an unbalanced formation and we're just running the same plays, guys. We're just running the same plays. We're mandatory outside release. We're, cr we're trying to create that triangle, right? However you get them there, however you get the pieces of the puzzle there. Okay. We're trying to create that triangle. Once again, trying to make it really easy for our quarterback. 
Hey, tempo. Okay, another way we think we can help the quarterback is tempo. I know I got three minutes here, guys. We'll try to go as fast as we can. We do that by just normal. Our normal is a no huddle. Okay, we do that by burst plays. Our burst is just all inclusive, one word calls, right? Based off, it tells you based off where the ball location is, right? We can also roll it, we can flip it, okay? Look back, we can control the tempo in that manner, right? We can freeze it, no play tempo, and then we can milk it, whether that be a four minute situation or right. We feel like we need to just slow down the game and control the clock. They don't have enough possessions to win, okay? Why change the tempo, control the pace of the game, keep the defense guessing, which we talked about earlier, right? Creates instant momentum and urgency. Right. If we're having if we're having trouble getting something going, right, we're going to try to go fast. We're going to try to change what we're doing. Right. If we're at, if we're having a lot of success, we're going to continue going fast. We're going to create the momentum. If we get the momentum, we're going to create the urgency. Right. Minimize simulated pressure blitz in certain situations, which we talked about. Right. And then force base alignment. He's being great. I think in order to be great at tempo. Right. Your players have to have a clear understanding of what each tempo has, the meaning of the purpose, and why you're doing it. Okay, all tempos must look the same pre-snap. Teach players where the referee is, right? Who do I need to hand it to? I need to hand it to the umpire. I need to hand it to the captain, right? Run it to the near hash. We tell our guys the goal is to beat the referee, right? You hear a lot of guys, hey, let's snap it with 30 seconds left on the clock, right? If they're standing over the ball, you can't snap it with 30 seconds left over the clock left on the clock. So at the end of the day, we're trying to beat the referee because if we're playing as fast as the referee is, then we're playing as fast as they're allowing us to play the game. Okay. Daily tempo periods. We go 10 minutes every day of burst periods, 10 minutes every day of some type of fast tempo kind of changing tempos within a period. So we understand the importance and how much we believe in it. Keep it simple. The faster you go. Okay. The faster we go, the faster we want to go based off the tempo, right? The more simplistic, maybe the more common, okay? The more plays that have answers. First plays, right? They're one words that means everything, right? They're going to have the tempo, the formation, the motion, the play, the snap count, all included, okay? Why burst plays? I think it's easier for the player and the play callers, right? If we got a 17-word tag play in there that we think is going to score, why not just give it a one-word one name, right? Changes the tempo, create different looks within the long play calls, right, and creates urgency and ownership for the players, right? Because at the end of the day, guys, what they believe in and what we can get them to believe in is what we're going to be good at. Coach, that's all I got. Perfect, Coach. I mean, question for you. Like, from a, 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 a how much time do you spend practice-wise from an individual or pod or group perspective on the sprint out stuff? Um, and kind of what does that look like? So kind of during special teams periods for us, uh, we'll try to steal a receiver. We'll try to steal a guy that's not involved. And then we'll try to kind of just incorporate some different um, movements, whether that be strip, whether that be true sprint out, whatever that might be. The great thing about just creating your pass game to where you're just truly reading down the ladder, whether that be a high-low read or just across the piano, whether that be kind of just an outside in uh, progression, the quarterbacks where they're throwing to doesn't change much. We're just changing how the characters are getting there. And so you don't have to spend a great deal of time uh, throwing to different spots, if that makes sense. It does. Now, I mean, how many of your concepts from a sprint out perspective can you also just run from a true drop back? Uh, so, like, I, so I'll go ahead and I'll try to, I'll try to basically install as many schemes as I can, just pure drop back. And then we'll just, we'll just motion them and move them into those sprint out concepts. And they might just have to tinker a little bit based off of the quarterback moving. And then that's how we'll teach the receivers. Okay. And so if I'm just, if I'm going to install China, I just install basically what we call Nebraska. I just install that as a drop back concept and then teach them based off of what the, what the sprint out is, what the front side, back side rules of those concepts are, how that protection or how that uh, sprint out, basically how we change that launch point with, a, with the offensive line, how that changes their thought process. Okay. Do, 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 do any of the sprint out from, from being a drop back to a sprint out, does that change or alter the quarterback's reads at all, or does that all fairly stay the same even though you're moving um, out of the pocket? 
that's fairly going to stay the same uh, just based off how we build it. Now, his thought process from a timing standpoint might change a little bit, but how he's going to go about reading it and how he's going to try to affect the defense with his eyes is, is pretty much going to stay very similar in that, in that family of plays. Yeah. Now, you mentioned earlier that you, you were having some issues with the, what was it, the, um, some of the blocking. I mean, yeah, so, so the full sprint out, and then, uh, you know, you see some people turn to the backside gap, and then you see some people reach it to their frontside gap. And so when we first got to Evangel from Jacksonville State, kind of we had trouble getting getting it reached. And so everything, we had no kind of vertical movement there, so everything was just leaking into the, into the pocket of the quarterback. And so we could never really get our shoulders downhill. We could never really get the edge of the defense, uh, per se, from the backfield. And so we have – we've kind of decided to move the offense offense line away from where the quarterback's going and then send the the extra hat off the edge just to try to give him a little bit more depth and a little bit of momentum to be able to sustain that block a little bit. Okay. Okay. When you don't have a dude at right tack where you don't feel like you have enough athletes to be able to reach that and get it, get it kind of sustained right there. Okay. Hey, and you mentioned in there as well, I think this will be one of the last questions that, You'll occasionally, what was it? I think you said you put a six alignment at tight end just to kind of help. Yeah, I mean, we're going to try to per- – what we believe in and kind of what I've I've always – most of my career – when I was at Jacksonville State, we had really good players. Uh, don't get me wrong. But I was in my playing days in Louisiana Monroe, when I was coaching Louisiana Monroe, here at Evangel at times, uh, our Jimmys and Joes aren't always the most talented. So we've got to be unique. We've got to be kind of different in what we do. And I think – just kind of how we game plan, we, we kind of personnel wise, we're going to try to always get our 11 best. And so whether that be six or seven offensive linemen, whether that be five wide receivers and empty, uh, I'm, I'm a big empty guy. So at the end of the day, whatever 11 best can get us lined up to where we can have some success matchup wise, that's what we're going to end up doing. So whether it just be formationally, we might have to be able to get it formationally or we're just running out of pieces of the puzzle. I know some high school guys have that problem at times uh, and just, you know, whatever, it, however we can get our best 11, however we need to line up to be able to run what we think needs to be successful. Okay. Now, I mean, and that week, that week they had some really good players. So we just, we, we figured we were best at offensive line instead of the tight end mismatch. So we put a, put an offensive lineman at the tight end position. Okay. Now, now with that, like, I mean, as I'm waiting on our next speaker to log in, um, what is the best way to A, Get a hold of you for anybody that wants to get a hold of you, talk more ball with you, and B, uh, what so, so and I, I think NAIA has had seen a gigantic growth over the past, I don't know, past really since I'd say probably since COVID. They've done you, NAIA, NAIA schools have done a really good job at recruiting and increasing recruiting. How, how what's the best way for people who have some kids to reach out to you guys for that as well? Yeah, my Twitter is Coach Wells EU. Uh, just go ahead and reach out there. Um, and then just uh, wellc at evangel.edu. Um, some of that information was on, on my slides at the front intro. Um, just reach out. We're always looking for players. At the end of the day, I don't think high school guys are getting recruited enough. Um, I know college football is going nuts right now. And quite honestly, I love being in an AI during it just because the pure the pure love of the game is still there at this level. And it's, it's quite honestly – uh, dwindle in a way with the NIL stuff and all that kind of stuff. And we've got to keep our game strong and we've got to keep doing what we do for a living. Uh, the main reason why we got into this thing. And um, at the end of the day, I love what you high school coaches do. I think that y'all have the hardest job when it comes to just, you've got to play with what you got. And uh, we feel that a little bit at our level, um, but we also get to go pick at times who we're going to, who we're going to get to play with as well. But, we would love to get any any and all players. We evaluate any and all. And at the end of the day, there's a place to play for every kid out there that wants to play. Um, he might have to invest in himself a little bit, but at the end of the day, um, you got to do what you got to do to go make your dreams come true. Okay. Perfect, Coach. Well, Coaches, like I said, give him a follow on Twitter or reach out to his email. Um, we'll get back to – all this cut up and then also you can go back to the beginning of his thing to also get more information there. Coach, thank you. I do appreciate it. Um, I appreciate you. Me, coach. Thank you, coach. All right. On to our, let's see if I can get him to unmute. 
um, the, the the big tuna there. Um, can you hear me, my friend? Yeah, I got you. How are you? Doing good, my friend. Doing good. It, it's one of our, I mean, bringing back one of the, the originals. Um, how's everything going? Hey, it's great out here. How about you? Doing good. Doing good. Oh, I'm glad you're doing well. Um, how, um, I think I uh, just double checking my stuff real quick. So um, I'll do my spiel. If you want to go and share your screen, um, I can, while, you, while I'm doing my spiel, so you're good to go. Um, um, coaches, um, I think we're our last speaker for session one, um, a longtime friend of the channel who I've had on numerous times. Um, I'll see. Now we're getting into baseball. There you go, coach. There you go. Um, but, um, I've had coach on coach was one of the first original, like five or six videos. I don't know on the channel, some of the original ones. I mean, he talked a bunch of line play. I've had him on the podcast on numerous instances. Uh, coach is going to talk connecting your program to the community. Um, and, uh, coach Dom G, uh, how do you pronounce your high school again? Carruthersville. Carruthersville out there in, uh, the great state of Missouri. He's the head football coach. Um, I don't know what you want to have on your screen right now, coach, but all we see is game changer. So if that affects anything. Hmm. So you might have to unshare and reshare. This is why this nice thing of being live. You get to see all the, the, <laughs> The, the hiccups, as we say. Um, but, yeah, Coach is going to talk about – Coach has done a really good job at um, increasing turnout um, and player participation out there. Um, me and him talk every now and then, and he uh, – obviously I follow his uh, program, and um, he, has, he does a really good job, job with game nights and various other things to get kids just involved. And there you go, Coach. Um, and – I mean, he's done a good job at turning it around and um, doing, he's doing things the right way. And that's what I think matters. Um, and I think we're, I mean, like 30 seconds ahead of schedule. So, Coach, uh, I mean, my friend, the the floor is yours. All right. Um, hey, everybody. I'm Dom Guglielmo. I'm the head football coach at Crowsville High School in Missouri. Um my path here has been pretty interesting. I started off as uh, restricted earnings, tend to college, to GA to college, to full-time to college, to assistant high school, and then now to the head football coach here. Um, a little bit about kind of where we're at. Um, we're in the boot hill, Missouri, so where you can basically see Arkansas and Tennessee if you stand up on top of the field house. Um, town of about 6,500 people. Strong football tradition, very supportive place. Um, when I took over, you know, the previous two head coaches ago had, had a really good run of things. He stepped down. Um, COVID hit, hired a new guy. The new guy didn't work out. Um, and then they hired me. So when I took over, there had been a lapse of community outreach and a lot of everything kind of missed the mark. Um, and the guys at Performer did a good job, but holding it together, I think our superintendent stepped in and, and coached the program the year before I got here. And he used to be the head football coach here. So strong tradition. Um, but when I took over, there was a couple holes. And it's pretty easy to fill the one that I'm going to talk about. And connecting your program to the community is huge. Um, I think it's a mark that's missed a lot. Um, my, I mean, my alma mater – has won two or three state titles in the last eight years. Um, I think they'd be more successful if they out, if they embrace the community a little bit more. Um, but I think that this is something that we can all kind of do. Um, first, what's your football community and take the football team out of it. Uh, they're, they're the family, they're the household. So what's around it, um, here for us businesses, there's a, there's a few 
small small businesses. We got the steel mill. There's a lot going on here and in the surrounding area that that needs to be tapped into, and that we kind of have tapped into. Um, being in Missouri, we all know that Bible Belt area. Um, we have 39 churches in our small town, so that's a big part of our community, um, which creates a complex equation when you're talking about the separation of church and state. The townspeople, um, the townies, the people that live here, the people that are born and raised here. I'm an outsider. I grew up in upstate New York, and I moved here and didn't know anybody. The alumni, again, is one of those marks that I feel a lot of programs miss big. What I refer to as the normal kids and the teachers, the normal kids to me are the ones that don't play football. Football players are abnormal. They do a lot of work for two and a half hours on a Friday night, 10 times, 12 times, 13 times if you're lucky. And then in bold, the, the ultimate bane of some high school coaches' existence is the parents. Now, they can either be your enemy or they're your best friend. First, connect with your businesses in town. So here, I think the big ones are we've got a couple restaurants. We've got the tea shop and a couple local stores. Shop there. It's as simple as that. Like, am I going to pay a couple extra dollars on Monday to go buy a fishing shirt from the store downtown? 100%. But that fishing shirt brought my face to the business owner that sits in the stands on Friday nights. When I go out and buy pens and pencils and school supplies, I buy it from Pema Scott Office Supply. I could order it on Amazon. I wouldn't have to go. I know what I want. But the Pema Scott Office Supply guy also is working with me with the Hall of Fame and doing a bunch of other stuff for the program. So just shopping there. It's different than going in and introducing yourself because if you go into a business, introduce yourself and then ask for something, you only introduce yourself because you asked. It's as simple as that. Be involved in their business. Give back. You that that fifteen dollars you're spending on pens and paper might sponsor a kid to play in your youth baseball program. That all funnels back in. We and we have this thing called Legends Night, which I'll get to. Um, I took it from my last job where we have our own kind of football hall of fame thing going on. And we we certify legends. And what we do is we go through the record books and conversations and stuff like that. And we have a big dinner and um we and we sell plates, spaghetti, our cheerleaders get all the money. We don't even use that as a fundraiser, but we invite the local business owners. I just drop off tickets. I'm like, hey, how many tickets do you want? It's this date. It's on the program. We invite them to everything. Everything that we do, we invite the businesses to be involved. Not asking for money, just inviting. Them. There is a point in the life of a high school football coach where you have to fundraise. If you're involved with the businesses, they're more apt to help you. They are. I'm not going to give my money to somebody I don't know. And you ask a small business for money, like you got to realize they might just be breaking even and they're still going to give you whatever they can. It's easy for Nucor, our steel mill, and our COSA, our other factory, to give you a sponsorship opportunity because they have a budget for that. The small businesses don't. And if you're involved with them, they'll support you to the end. And then when we have more home games, we all know that if you have five home games, one of them senior night and one of them's homecoming, so they're done. So you have three opportunities to honor the community. Small business night is huge. Let them set up a table. Let them come by. Let them give them the touchdown. So Crothersville scored a new life nutrition touchdown. I mean, that stuff matters in the grand scheme of things. And it'll bring you right into one of the avenues where, A, it's easier to fundraise, B, it's easier to build support, and C, you get back to where you live. Churches, like I said, in Crowsville, we've got 39 churches. We have a list of them in the paper. I counted them up last time I bought a paper, which was last week, and we went through them, and I was like, okay, so there's 39 churches. When I got here, the first person I met with was with our ministerial alliance. I had big ideas. I needed help. 
We need money. Um, we need support. And they funded our game night program, which I'm going to get to in a minute, for two and a half years. They gave us one big check, supported the program for two and a half years. We decreased our off-the-field incidents by 100%. We have zero. Before, we had a few. So that's an avenue. B, every church likes to cook. They all want to be involved. Our Feed the Tigers program that our Boost Club works with, I think 50% of the meals that we are provided are from the ministerial lines. So I know the church that I go to sponsors a meal and a couple others do too, and it's awesome. Let them be around the kids. They don't, the kids need to see the businesses involved, the churches involved. They have to see what they're playing for. And when a lot of our, a large population of our town is going to church on Sundays, that's a big thing that we need to kind of incorporate in an appropriate way into our program by just letting them have their hands on something. The townspeople. They're your biggest fans. They're the people that fill the bleachers. We're a small school. I think our high school enrollment's at 258, but we pack the house. So all 258 of those kids is not packing the house in our stadium. They're the people that are repping your gear and flagging you down at the grocery store to tell you how great this kid is and how you did call this play wrong and that play wrong. And, and you can embrace it because look, they're the people that keep the program. Every no kid dreams of playing on a Friday night with zero people in the stands. Point number one, let them see what you're doing. I like social media. I like scrolling through it. I don't think I've ever posted as much on Facebook as I do now that everybody in town wants to add you on Facebook. Post pictures of the kids. Get excited for them. Be excited for the sports that are around you. People love it. Let them see what you guys are doing. You're going to, and when you start fundraising now, we don't sell, I do most of the fundraising myself. Uh, we have the kids do a lift a thon, but I help them with sponsors and all of that. The money comes from the community, the small business, aunts and uncles that live down the road, neighbors, landlords, everything. Everything. They're where you buy the t-shirts and the hats and the jackets and all that kind of stuff. Reaching out to them is huge. And you get the Facebook reach, outreach, you get things put paper. We host a youth camp here that costs the community $0. Zero. And we'll find a sponsor for the t-shirts. The kids work it. We use the stadium. We play the music. Everything. Send your kids for the day. Have fun. Give back. We do our program. We worked with Southeast Food Bank, and we ran two um, food drives out of the back of our stadium. No football gear, nothing. Just the kids. Filling up boxes, handing out food. It was awesome for us. Not everything you do needs to be a fundraiser. We did. We sold Tiger Jackets. I work with a company called Sam Viper. Um, I bought them for the staff. Everybody liked them. I sold them at cost. It got Tigers gear out there. I love seeing when I walked into church today, it's all three of them. It's all it's it's great to see Tiger gear. It's great to do things for the community that not necessarily we're gonna profit on. Not everything has to be about profit. You're gonna spend your time, shoot, you might get bit in the butt a couple bucks here and there, but that stuff matters too. Do stuff for them. You have to win their hearts in the process of all of it. But I think the big thing is a lot of us look at, and I was one of them. I say was until very recently. Football is a business. It really is. You got to get the kids. You got to win. You got to do this. You got to do that. You got to have lifting. Shoot, I'm sitting in my field house now looking at the list of things that we have to clean up this week. We're going to have a spring clean day in the field house. In order for you to win their hearts, you have to let them win yours. You have to let you have to let the town in to your heart. You have to care about them. And I know a lot of coaches that go from here to here to here to here and shoot. I listed six jobs off. 
or five jobs off the bat. But when you're here, you're here. Your heart's here. I live in town. I won't move out of town because the Chiefs got to stay with the Indians. You got to be here. And I think the big thing is whenever we do something football-wise, there's other than game night, which is our Friday night program, everything's open to the community. Anybody can come. Do they all choose to? No. If they chose to, would it be awesome? Yes. But they always have the opportunity to be around us. They know your name. They know where you're from. Shoot, they know where you live, which is sometimes good and bad. Um, but they see your face. They see your program. They see your kids smiling and having fun. Helps loosen the pockets up a little bit. Helps put butts in the seats. If you're available, the kids are available. They see it. The practices are open. They're more apt to be there on Friday nights. And that's really what you want. Alumni. It's important. When I got here, there was no alumni association. First thing I did was I put out a Google form and I said, everybody sign up for the alumni association. And what the alumni association does for me is I send an email once a month, once every other month, um, ask for pictures, memories, stuff like that, turn that into Facebook posts, all that stuff. Kind of bring the past back to the present. We have a we've been we've had football here since 1915. Um, players of the year, all staters, people that have made it to play Division One football. Like you want those guys kind of involved in the program. You want them being proud that they're an alumni. Keep them informed. Shoot, my next email is just going to be, hey, we're starting spring ball, and half the kids. Are a third of the kids are playing baseball, a third of the kids are doing track, and a third of the kids are in the weight room. So we're going to have to figure, be creative with spring ball. They want to hear it. But you have a fundraiser, say, hey, this is our fundraiser that we're running right now. Hey, these, these three kids were our top lifters, all that. Communicate, let them be involved. I know there's programs that you could, like Blast Athletics has something that you can have an alumni group, and they can be watching videos and all that. I'm not a huge app thing app guy because i think you cut out a section of people when you use an app because not everybody's tech savvy but it's a useful tool celebrate things as much as you can last year we had a game where we celebrated a team that made it to the state semifinals the coach had passed away we got a plaque for his wife and his children um had the players go out there during halftime cheered they shared stories there was tears, there was laughter, there was a whole nine yards, sharing memories and all that kind of stuff. And it was awesome. It was awesome. It was great to see. I got to meet, I got to put some faces to names, guys that won players of the year and linemen of the year and all staters and all that. So we do the Legends Night where we honor Legends and we invited everybody. In our field house, when I got here, we made banners for the past conference championship teams, district championship teams card trophy winners, which is a top player in CMO and CMO offensive lineman of the year winners. And we have hang in the field house all the time. And the key is I left room to grow on every single one. So when the kids walk in, they see the past, they understand the football tradition and it kind of helps them push mentally forward. Normal students. It's the tough part because I know if there's a lot of high school coaches Watching, you hear the, well, football players get whatever they want, this and that. Athletes do this. They never get in trouble. And you get all the rigmarole of people generalizing what football players go through. I'm going to be honest with you. Between football and wrestling is two of the most demanding sports in any level. Um, our kids, the weight room is active all the year. Shoot, we have... It's our, it's our spring break, and I already just released the time, so the field house is going to be open voluntarily. These kids are always doing something. Always doing something. Community service, everything. They're active in the football group text all year. I even have the group text with the guys that are football players that play baseball. It's called the dang football or the dang baseball players, where I keep up with them and send them updates and when spring ball is and weight room times and ass bath times and everything. Um Normal kids don't get that. They just don't. It's their choice. 
Some kids can't play football, boys, girls, whatever. You want to get them involved as much as you can. Same thing with teachers. You want a teacher to call you before they call the assistant principal. And if my assistant principal is watching, I'm sorry. But in order to do that, they need to be involved in the program in some regard. I was at, I presented a playbooks clinic in February in Kansas City. I met a guy from Kansas City who does this thing. He calls it the STARS program where, where teachers can give out helmet stickers. And they get updates every week and they offer you offer the opportunity to give them a helmet sticker based on academic performance, attitude, effort, all the stuff that kind of you want to promote in the classroom. We started that. We call it the pause program. If you're interested in it, shoot me an email, mess me on Twitter. I'll send you what I, what we came up with here and for the Tigers. So Tiger pause fits us a little bit better, but I've had a lot of good feedback. It allows these teachers to, to give you something positive about the kids. It allows the, kids to look at the teachers in a more positive way because when you're giving out helmet stickers and you got a paw and it's from the English teacher and you're like, oh, I didn't think she liked me. Breaks down the barrier. I also have what I like, the normal kid. He, she makes all of our football graphics or basically any graphic that we post on social media, she makes. Last season, we had 39 postseason award winners from academic all state to all district to all conference. Da, da, da. She made every single one. We had a signing day for one of our players. Really proud of him. She set the whole thing up. She said, My idea sucked. She fired me. She did the whole thing, and it was awesome. She did great. Great job. But we're going to roll with that format forever. And that being said, all hands on deck. You want everybody that wants a role to kind of be able to contribute in one way or another. The teachers have their teacher or faculty and staff night. They get the jerseys on senior night, all that. We even had each kid in the program and coach, including myself, we videotaped who's their favorite teacher and why and tell them to thank them. And we put it all in a one clip cut video and posted it and sent it out to everybody. The amount of teachers that you saw with tears in their eyes because they were so happy that they were somebody's favorite teacher was amazing. All hands on deck. If you're going to be successful, all hands on deck. Parents. Parents. There's, I think that parents get a negative reputation when it comes to football and baseball and whatever sport you're playing. We have to embrace them. Are they going to criticize you? Yes. Are they going to say you called the wrong player? Are they going to say that you hate their kid because he's not starting? Are they going to do all that? Yep. But they'll also be your best friend. They'll be there through thick and thin for you. We we are a team reach team. Our parents have a different team reach than the kids do. Everything I post to the kids, I copy and paste, and I say for the boys. Colin, send the message so the parents already know everything that's going on when the field house is open, practice times, all of that. So there should never be a question uh, what's going on with the football program with the parent. B, we have a parent meeting every year. Uh, our attendance has grown over the last three parent meetings I've had since I've been here. And basically, we just let it all out. What coaches are here, what coaches left, what we're doing about this. This is where we lacked last season in this area, this area, this area. And this is what we're going to do to improve it. We have laid out policies from our athletic handbook that are copy and pasted in. We have a more football policies that are copy and pasted. So for instance, I won't meet with a parent without another coach there. That's a pretty standard rule, but I won't meet with a parent about playing time without their kid in the room. It's pretty simple. If your son has a problem with his playing time, he's going to be there. And we're all going to discuss it together. It works. I promise. Everything gets laid out when a kid's sitting there with it. We have different things for parents to get involved in with the program. I mean, team meals, huge. 
I mean, when you're feeding 50 football players, um, moms do it the best. That's just a fact. I don't know what it is about my mom's peanut butter and jelly that's different than my peanut butter and jelly. She just does it better. Moms do it better. Food. It's just a fact. Um, when we have game night, we invite some parents every week. Like, hey, do you want to come to game night? The kids are going to be playing video games or playing football or playing ping pong. We've got three ping pong tables and all that. Come play ping pong. Come chill with the coaches. Help serve the food so that they can see kind of how the team and the coaches interact. It frees us up to really monitor the kids, lets the parents feel involved, everything. We started a mom's club. We have a mom's practice where we invite the moms out to practice and they run through drills with the kids. It's hilarious. It, they have a blast with it. They always, last year, one of the moms was like, you make them run too much. I was like, we're just, we haven't even warmed up yet. It kind of puts it in perspective for parents when they see and they can kind of do what the kids are doing to how hard they're actually working. Does that mean I'm trying to get them out of the chores? No. Do I want them to understand how hard they're working? Yes. We have a mom's club. They have their own logo. We're getting t-shirts. They're, they're main, they're going to have their own fundraising account with a debit card that a mom's going to run. So we're going to have little mom club fundraisers that kind of puts money into that. Um, so when we stop at McDonald's on our way home from a game, mom's club's on it. If we need help with the team meal, the mom's club's on it. We're trying to host some stuff this summer. The moms are going to cook. It's, it's really good to have them involved. You have to set a wall with them. Just because I'm letting you be involved doesn't mean you make player decisions. That's coaches. But I've had less complaints about playing time and everything like that since the parents have been exposed to really what we're doing. And that makes a difference. So when we go through all of this to really wrap it up, and I, I hit on a lot of different things pretty quick, like game night is our Friday night program, our alumni association, our legends night, um, our pause program, lift -a -thon, any of that stuff that you might be interested in, feel free to reach out and I'll send you whatever I have on it. I'm, we're an open book with everything that we do. Um, I send a board report every month of everything that's going on in the football program, how much money we raised, how much money we spent, what fundraisers are coming, what's coming, how many kids have been in the weight room. So the board knows everything that's going on with us. Um, well, who's on our roster, send them a roster updates, everything. We're, I believe in an open book policy. It cuts down on the questions. It cuts down on the, what are you doing with this? What are you doing with that? I put my coach's evaluations in there. I evaluate myself and my evaluations always seem like they're the hardest ones. I'm the hardest on myself. Um, but all that stuff, if you want it, please feel free to reach out. You're, you're welcome to whatever we do. Um, I think the biggest thing that I want you to understand, when I got here, numbers were low. Community involvement was low. I think the year before I got here, we were two and eight. Um, Year one, we started a couple little programs, and the, our, our roster number grew. So we went from, I think, that 19 the year before, graduated five. So we brought back 14 kids, and we grew that 14 kids to 28 kids. Yeah, 28 kids. Um, then year, full year two, we added, we expanded game night. We started Legends Night. We started the parents club, we started getting the businesses involved in everything. And we went from a roster size of 28 to 38. And then um, 1,200 people, almost 2,000 people now, I think, and on the Facebook and the alumni association is thriving and all of this kind of stuff. We raised a ton of money without having to do a ton of work because people were like, I want to sponsor this kid. I want to sponsor a kid. I want to sponsor a kid. I want to sponsor a kid. I was like, okay, make your check out to Crowsville School District. Perfect. And the parent, people got to see the warm-ups that we bought them and all of that. 
And then now we're returning 33 kids with 18 kids coming up from the middle school. So it's allowed us to really grow the brand back. And I say back because there is a strong football tradition here. Allow the community to get back involved and be supportive and see the kids and see the coaches and put butts in the seat and really revitalize the football program. And naturally, I'm just the idea guy. I got a group of people that really take my idea, tell me that I can do better and then make me do it better. I have a crew of parents that are really supportive in that role. Um, my staff gives a lot of input and does a lot of great things with making the program better every single day, constantly clinicking and growing and building bonds with the kids. And we wouldn't kind of be, we wouldn't have went from two and eight to four and five to seven and four with a home playoff win in two and a half years without the, the kids buying into the weight program, the kids buying in the program, the coaches buying in to themselves and the kids in the community buying back in without any of the without any of the stuff that we've done. So my email is here. It's at Coach Googly or uh, D G Googly Amo at CPS18.org. Um, my Twitter handle's there. Follow me on Twitter. I'll follow you back. Um, I always check my Twitter messages. I always check my email. Nothing really goes unanswered with me. If you want anything, need anything, want to talk football, please feel free to reach out. Please feel free to reach out. All right, Coach, just sit, sit right there real quick while I finish this up and on the stream, then we can chit-chat. Um, coaches, like I said, if you got any questions, email, um, put them in the chat real quick before we wrap this up. Um, send them a DM. Uh, coach will get back to you. I've known Coach four years now. Seems like so much longer because of the COVID year. But um, – you just reach out to coach. He's doing a really good job there. Um, there's some stuff I wrote down in there that I might add going forward. Um, and otherwise, um, like I said, we'll pick back up at six Eastern uh, with, I think, I think off the top of my head without looking at the schedules, Mitch Johnson talking shallow and mesh. Um, so we'll get back to some air raid stuff. Um, but if you're interested, um, hit up the second half. That'll be posted later and the replays of this will be on here soon. And possibly.